بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends and boy oh boy is this going to be a wonderful podcast because with us today we have our amazing beautiful brother Fahim Farouk and before I give him direct salams and before we get into his bio actually before we give him salams I'm going to get into his bio because many of you may not know who he is and you need to know who he is so I'm going to talk about his bio then I'm going to give him salams and then we're going to go straight into it so Fahim Farooq is pursuing postgraduate studies in Islamic psychology and philosophy. He also has a background in nutrition and exercise science. He is known as the Green Pill Coach. And we're going to talk about that soon, inshallah. Having founded his coaching practice, Becoming Rijal, Becoming Men, the Green Pill. It is a holistic approach to life through corrective exercise, sound nutrition, mixed martial arts, MMA, addiction recovery and masculinity and relationship coaching programs that have been running for the past nine years alhamdulillah fahim also founded majesty and beauty which seeks to engage modern inversions that challenge muslims beliefs and practice by highlighting the correct balance found in islam he also previously volunteered as a research assistant for safina society and discussed modern relationships uh, and men's issues on a variety of podcasts when available for him mentor, mentors youth in his local muslim community and coordinates youth services through the bdkw welfare foundation for him my brother assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi welcome wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it's my honor and pleasure to be here my brother no this is uh firstly i have to publicly apologize because we've tried to arrange this maybe two or three times and i think the reason they didn't happen is totally my fault. So I do apologize oh, yeah. for, oh, for your yeah. patience and for your ilm and for your forbearance. Now, before we get into the kind of technical questions about blue pill, red pill, green pill, feminism, right. masculinity, rujula, all of these things. When did we first meet? First and foremost, no hard feelings at all, bro. I know you're a busy guy and you're serving the, the ummah in really wonderful ways. So... I appreciate your apology, but it's all good. I'm just honored that you have extended this opportunity for me. You know, it's been something that I've wanted to do <clears throat> for a long time, but I have intentionally kept my message low key because I wanted to focus on personal development with my teachers. And I wanted to ensure that I didn't just jump onto the scene like a lot of other grifters have without ensuring that I know my stuff, at least well enough to serve people in the capacity that I actually want to, right? So thank you very much. Barakallahu fikum. As for your question, when did we first meet? I remember it clearly. I was actually 17 years old, finishing 12th grade in Canada. And you made your very first trip to Waterloo at the University of Waterloo, actually. And you were doing a seminar on Islam and atheism. I think it was related to whether or not atheism is reasonable or is Islam reasonable, right? And I was sitting in the audience and I asked you a question related to uh, causality, timeless, timeless causality. And you were like, you know, a little intrigued because I, I looked a little younger than most of the other kids in the uh, or students in the audience. They're all like young adults. And then after you answered my question, I, I approached you and we shook hands. You asked me, like, you know, where am I from? How did I come to know of you? And I told you that I was you know, finishing 12th grade and you were like, you're so young. What, what, what are you doing here? And I explained that I actually started to find your videos on YouTube because I was trying to uh, grapple with my own agnosticism and then classmates who had obviously been secularized and fell into atheism. And at that time, like this was way back before Facebook and YouTube had developed very much like, you know, it was those pioneering days. So you didn't have things like Basira Academy. Why is Islam true? Those types of courses didn't didn't exist in the English speaking world. And I was disconnected from a lot of traditional scholarship because in Canada at that point, unlike the UK, we didn't have a, a very well-established uh, Islamic infrastructure. So you had very lay kind of uh, what we call normie Muslims. You know, they have like a very basic grasp of the five pillars. And then they have a lot of cultural attachments to Islam that were ingrained in them from childhood. And that, that's about it. You had a few masajid. Um, we did have an imam who is a muhaddid, but 
I didn't even know what that term meant back then. Right. So when I found your stuff, it really captivated me because I, I was I was deeply moved to know that we have a rich tradition. And I owe that to you. I don't I don't know if I would have been where I am today, here and now. I don't know if I would have met all the other scholars that I have met in the Muslim world. And I don't know if my Iman would have been preserved had it not been for you. So no, no, that's, that's I mean that. Silly. That bro, I remember I think that was 2008, and it was a talk on the white hat approach to God, I believe. And something I like think, that, yeah. yeah. Something like that. And um we had a conversation offline, and you said, I think it was you who told me, I, I tweeted this earlier. I, I don't remember saying this, but apparently I said to you, deal with feminism. Is that true? You you said that to me uh later on. I was 24. You came to Canada again. This was at Wilfrid Laurier. Okay. Uh, you were doing a workshop on, I think, uh, a Dawa workshop. Yeah. That was that was like a, six years later. And you were saying, you know, don't let feminism spread in Canada. Yeah. So, for, oh, wow. from, yeah, from, from today, that would have been about six years ago. Yeah. Maybe more, I think. Maybe more. Seven. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Six or seven. Yeah. So. Wow. Wow. May Allah bless you, bro. Oh, There's a few kind words. But just to be very authentic and not to have any undeclared negative intentions, Hamza Zodis back then was, I mean, I was just like a compiler compiling stuff from sources that I didn't yeah. even check myself properly. So yeah. I was on my own journey as well. So all the nice words that you're saying, this was all from Allah. And it just I'm reminds me, I'm not saying it applies to me, hopefully it doesn't, but it reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I say this to dua as well, so we, we become very careful. Because sometimes we think popularity is a, is a form of acceptance, and it's not. And where the meaning of the hadith is, that you know, Allah would progress or promote his religion through a fasik, right? right? Through someone who is disobedient, someone who's a public um, sinner. And we need to be very, very careful with regards to these issues because sometimes, you know, as du'a, we think, yeah, I have all of these likes and followers and all of this praise, and this means there is a form of acceptance. I think that is quite shallow. You know, inshallah, we have. We have good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That Allah accepts our deeds Private and public That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grants us ikhlas and sincerity And that he would forgive our shortcomings And our major and minor sins Our inner sins and our outer sins Our public sins and our private sins But you know The Hamza Dodis then was like Oh my god I mean even now We're all work in progress But Zakra here for the kind word So Oh, yeah. There's a lot of questions, bro. I really want to get into it. I know you have a lot to offer. So the first one is a big one, right? Bismillah. Let's do it. What on earth is this monster called feminism? <laughs> what is feminism? You know, feminism is such a convoluted series, uh, a series of movements, a set of schools, and it carries so much historical, political, economic, and even theological slash spiritual baggage that it's it's very shocking that we have people in our communities identifying with it carelessly as if you know if something is has so much baggage you would you would want to verify what exactly is this thing and we find that on the ground the vast majority of women modern women both amongst muslims and non-muslims who carelessly identify with it have actually no understanding of what it actually involves at best they are grappling, uh, grappling onto a very populist form of feminism, right? The whole, you know, my body, my choice, hashtag me too, right? Uh, I don't need a man. A, a man t to a woman is like a, is like a fish on a bicycle or whatever that, that uh, idiom was. And all kinds of other attitudes that, ha that have a, an underlying disdain for men, uh, which seek to subvert the masculine principle or, or imperative and beyond that, it just shows up in attitudes of uh, passive aggressiveness towards men, uh, disdain for traditional you know, relationship, relationship forms, and so on and so forth. But none of them would actually, unless they're in academia or, or at least spend some time reading, would highlight to you the fact that there have been multiple movements right, for over the past few uh, century and a half, if not longer. Right? You, can, you can trace back the pioneering feminist thinkers into the 1800s. And what very few people realize is that many of their uh, beliefs 
and the circumstances around why they were committed to pioneering feminist thought are very poorly transmitted today. For example, you, you won't find most people who understand the, the, the relationship between first wave feminism and the suffragettes and the theosophical movement in society, which has to do with something called theosophy. And that is a very dajalic, a, a very, uh, a very inverted form of spirituality, right? Susan B. Anthony, for example, is one of the pioneering feminists and she herself was involved with the Theosophical Society and had many occult beliefs. And for people who don't know what the occult is, it refers to a, an alternative spirituality that you'll see in, in, in a very lay form today. Like if you go on TikTok and IG, you'll, you'll look at a lot of different uh, posts by different women talking about the divine feminine, right? Uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll see them talking about sacred womb healing and this sort, sort of new age language. And it is actually traceable back to the Theosophical Society's philosophy that had a vision of inverting gender dynamics as part of their philosophy, right? And what does it mean to invert gender dynamics? Well, you want to make the masculine effeminate and you want to make the feminine masculine. And so this aspect of feminism needs to be understood to understand all the subsequent movements, the different waves, second wave, third wave, what became fourth wave. Now you see it, it has basically morphed into the LGBTQ movement, which has cannibalized, you know, figures from previous movements like J.K. Rowling got canceled. She's a third wave, classic third wave feminist. She's been cannibalized for criticizing the LGBTQ. And so feminism doesn't have a singular definition, but it does have underlying currents and themes. You can look at feminism from a liberal point of view, liberal feminism. You can look at it from a Marxist point of view, Marxist feminism. You can look at it from radical, a radical point of view, radical feminism. And they have differences in how they view the condition of women. They have differences in how they view why women are suffering. What, what are the actual, what's the actual relationship between the state and women's suffering? What, what's the relationship between different classes and their class struggles and women's suffering? But regardless of all this academic mumbo jumbo, there's one unifying theme. And it is that they believe that there is a global patriarchy even to this, to this day, even still in the West. And they believe that it needs to be dismantled because it's responsible for causing all their suffering, all their oppression. And so feminism at its core, it doesn't matter what brand you look at. It doesn't matter if you look at decolonial feminisms, which want to look at black and brown women's experiences or liberal, you know, middle-class white feminism, all of them unite on one point. They have a disdain for any concept of male authority that has any form of control over any woman, whether it's a husband and his wife, whether, whether it's a father and his daughter. And so this is at the heart of feminism. This is at the heart of their definitions of oppression and power dynamics. They can't conceive of a just form of male power over women. That doesn't exist in their paradigm. It doesn't exist in their ontology. Any situation where you have a man in power over women, by their terms, it must entail oppression. And so this is where it's, things get very, very tricky. It's, when it's very, good that you, very good that you've mentioned yeah. that because when I was reading about first wave, second wave, third wave, and what transpired into fourth wave, and there's a debate is you know, fourth wave kind of distinct, is it connected to third wave and all of that stuff. Right. It's, it's very hard to basically pin down feminism from an academic point of view. Right. But I just want to push back on one point. Sure. Would you, would you say what, you know, you're kind of, and by the way, the reason I really like what you've just done is because you've, you've gone to the kind of basic principle that underlines or it's a thread that weaves right through first wave, second wave, third wave, and fourth wave. But the point is this, first wave, surely, wasn't it just about women not wanting to be property, that they're just considered as a human being? Wasn't it about that really? You know, what would you say about that? Well, if you look at the actual lectures of second wave feminists, such as um, Simone de Beauvoir, the French feminist, she admits openly that in the initial uh, feminist movements, the vast majority of women did not want to sign on with the feminist movement. 
and a lot of feminist uh, activists and thought leaders, they've expressed frustration and resentment over this fact. They have described many traditional women who were the vast majority of women at the time as being their own worst enemies, right? So if it's true that there was a consensus on such frustrations, and there were, de there were definitely, especially in the Western world, uh, areas of mistreatment of women, even from a shuddy point of view, but there were many values and, and practices that you can find overlap within Islamic history and within the Sharia, uh, as represented by the four madahib, that all feminists would still have problems with, right? For example, uh, if you look at the four madahib, the fact that uh, a, a wife has to have her husband's permission to even gain, gain employment, provided that her shari rights are being fulfilled, is something that many feminists would counter as, as a, an example of patriarchal and misogynistic um, layers in Islam. That, for, for example, the first wave, first first wave, wave, first wave uh, feminists, right? Uh, and the average traditional woman back then, they probably would find, in contrast, they probably would find that the Islamic world has a better understanding of women's justice than the Western world. They, they would have been happy with Islamic patriarchy in that time, right? Uh, but if you look into how even the first wave feminists progressed, there were shuyuk in the late Ottoman period, like Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, rahimullah, in his book, which tr is translated uh, to mean my statement concerning women. He criticizes Western men for basically trying to exploit women because there were a lot of men involved in the early feminist movements who were uh, co 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 uh, conspiring or you could say cooperating with some of these elite suffragettes who were elite. They were not middle class, like there was no established middle class in the same way as there is today, but they weren't like the normal average woman, right? They were by no means representative of the average woman who had a much, much poorer quality of life. And a lot of those men were accused by our shuyuk for trying to exploit women by deconstructing the traditional family, right? Or tradition, traditional aspects of family life, like basic concepts of ghaira, that you're not going to just allow your women folk to roam into the presence of strange men, even to do business blindly, right? There are very strict conditions for how that should be done. And Sheikh Mustafa Sabri said that they're doing this because this is actually opening doors for them to have illicit sex to, to fulfill their desires more easily. That you don't have to be a man who's responsible in a family. You can just, you know, loosen the, lo lo loosen the ropes of a conservative society. And then you can actually get your way with women much more easily. Right. So. Well, that's very interesting. So Sheikh, yeah. Sheikh Sabri, right? So Sheikh, Sheikh Sabri, Sabri. May Allah, yeah, may Allah have mercy on him. He was basically saying that there were men who were kind of using the first wave movement to open the door for them to be less responsible and for them to engage in, you know, their shahawat, the, the blameworthy desires. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah? That's very interesting. That's right. that's a remarkable insight. That's a remarkable Subhanallah. insight. SubhanAllah. So now pushing back again, the first wave feminists might say, you know, or the, or the second wave feminists might say, you know, we didn't get much grassroots support right? because, and I know this may come from a kind of Marxist perspective, but they'll be like, because there was a class issue because the first wave fe first wave feminists were mainly white and they weren't you know the lower class they were they were in the upper classes and also they might say well women were dominated by this oppressive masculine hierarchy for so long that they don't know any better how would you respond to that kind of discourse well this would assume that what they're offering the women in the first place was good right and they would have the onus would be on them to prove that all of their claims uh, were, in fact, solutions to genuine problems. And mm. the onus is on them to prove that. Secondly, it would require that they establish that the average woman was woefully unaware of her own circumstances, right? That, she, that she's woefully unaware. But then they're contradicting themselves whenever they're trying to take the testimony of women. How is it that women, when they support what they think is patriarchy, then they're unaware, but when they support the feminist narrative, then they're aware, right? There's a double standard in establishing the validity of the testimony. When, when, it, when exactly is a woman's testimony worth considering? 
And in this case, they're just a priori, you know, presuming that, you know what, whenever they support us, they're truthful. Whenever they're not, they're, they're just unaware simpletons, which is ironically very misogynistic. And that sounds like an ideology. It's a blind ideology. ideology. Only right. They would only, you know, they have this kind of ideological lens and anything that supports them, they'll basically accept. And anything that doesn't, they'll, they'll, they'll blind themselves to that or they'll dismiss it through their own ideological, non-negotiable assumptions. Okay, that's very good. So right. second question. So, you know, you hear sometimes that maybe there are some forms of feminism that are compatible with Islam. Is that true? Some people try to raise that argument. And I, I really considered it just to be fair. And the best case scenario I found was uh, the late Saba Mahmoud. She has passed away since she wrote one of her books. May Allah give her Jannah. I mean, it was called The Politics of Piety. And she was basically trying to argue for certain uh, Shari norms that relate to women, you know, wearing niqab. Right from a from within the feminist discourse, and she admits in her own book that, despite her her sincere intentions for most of her life, she found it very difficult to reconcile a lot of orthodox norms, from a from a conceptual level, creedal creedal level, and also from a uh, fiqhi practice level, praxi oriented level, hmm. and th that would that would include things like hierarchy in a marriage. You know, like the husband has authority over the wife, and and so. For one, this means she understood that that was a that was a reality. She didn't try to, you know, redo thick through bent thick, we like to call mo modern attempts at you know, um, uh, appealing to women influenced by feminism. She didn't try to do that. She understood that the Sharia has an established foundation and applications that are built upon over fourteen centuries of scholarship with with consensus and she admits that it was tough for her to grapple with and accept everything in it and what that shows me is number one she was she was very honest i appreciate that she was very honest um i don't think she wore hijab for most of her life but i have to double check i'm not sure if she adopted it later in her life i'll have to double check that but what but what it also shows on top of that is that by being within the feminist discourse she felt the friction that was unavoidable. And that means that it doesn't matter, even if you try to argue for Islamic, certain Islamic norms from within the feminist discourse, you're going to run into some serious walls. Hmm. You're going to run into some serious contradictions. And there's no way to reconcile them. Even if you say, hey, you know what? Men only have authority because it was delegated by Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Like all acts of worship are predicated on submission to Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa most feminists are going to have a knee-jerk reaction the same way they did to Christian theology, right? Because a lot of Muslims, they try to, they try to uh, pass by the idea that they only reacted to Christianity that way because they had a more patriarchal theology where, you know, God is the father, right? Yeah. And the son. But then Christians have responded with, oh, but we also believe in the mother. And, and it, it, for us, it's like, that's all irrelevant. It's all kufr. It's all shirk. And the feminists will have the same same kind of knee-jerk reaction to Allah is without gender, but he only chose males to be prophets and messengers upon whom be peace and blessings, which is the majority opinion. I know a minority of, of scholars consider uh, Sayyidah Maryam as a potential prophetess, but that's not the, ma the majority opinion by any means. They'd have a problem with that. They'd also have a problem with, well, why did God command certain things that are patriarchal in form, right? The caliph can only be a man. The husband is the head of the household. Imams can only be men, right? In, in many, many opinions, the qadi being a man is preferred. Um, I know that there are other opinions that's, that permit women to be judges as well. But from what I have seen, uh, the majority of judges were men, right? So, if we try to rescue feminism and if we try to reconcile it with Islam, there's going to be headbutting at some level. And every yeah, feminist yeah. I know, every single one, every single woman I know who has tried to do that, they, they end up with a lot of grief. They end up headbutting a lot with various aspects of our deen 
and it, it really affects them psychologically too because there's a cognitive dissonance. Mm. The thing is, just like with any ism, like I'm of the view that you don't, you need to build something from the ground up. What do right. I mean by that? So when you have a problem in society, when you have a philosophical problem, a theological problem, you have an existential question, you have a political question, you have a question about gender, you have a question about relationships, individual and social. From an Islamic perspective, we have a worldview. We believe in Allah. We believe in the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We believe in the Islamic source texts. We believe in, you know, the, the scholars of the past were standing on their shoulders. And we have these timeless sources of knowledge. We have these and principles have been derived by the ulama, by the scholars that we apply to problems. So we build it from the ground up. And in many cases, there, it's already been solved. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, the classical ulama, the classical scholars. Our job really in many cases is to make make what they taught us contemporary. To I don't know if this is a word, but to contemporize, right. to make it applicable in our time and space with certain different nuances and language and the way we frame it for sure. And what happens a lot, especially amongst the youth and people at university, they hear things like feminism, postmodernism, they hear things like humanism, liberalism, neoliberalism, Marxism, and all of these isms and schisms. And what they try and do, they try and Islamify those things because what they do subconsciously and consciously, they say, well, I, I believe in this. Marxism must be true because I've learned this at university and it sounds so true which in many cases means it's aligned with my shahawat, my blameworthy desires, right, it's aligned right. with my nafs, with my ego. And therefore I have to Islamify it now because I have this thing called Islam, which I identify with, right? From an, from an identity perspective, they haven't really thought about the deen profoundly. I identify with this and I now believe in this new idea that I've learned at university. So, you know, I can't reject either of them. So I'm going to try and es Islamify Marxism, for example. Right. And what happens is every ism, every ideology, every worldview has its own presuppositions, has, have, has its own assumptions. Those assumptions can, can either be grounded rationally and they're coherent or they're irrational and they're not coherent. And I'm of the view that every single ism and ideology on the face of this, of this earth has assumptions that cannot be grounded rationally and they're incoherent. In other words, they're not aligned with the Quran and the Sunnah and basically orth Islamic orthodoxy. And that's why they're going to get that friction. And you've explained that very well in your example examples with feminists where, you know, you use the word headbutting, right? They're going to headbutt, yeah. you know, Islamic fit or Islamic aqidah or the established well-known you know, hierarchies in our deen that are necessary and moral for a functioning society because they've come from Allah. Allah has the picture. We just got a pixelated understanding of reality. Oh, so, so, so you're right. So, and this leads to a very important question, where, which is, well, what are the major contradictions, therefore, between Islam and feminism, right? What are the major contradictions that you faced maybe at university or amongst youth or just generally in your intellectual work? All of your descriptions, they brought me back to uh, my, my, my uh, undergraduate traumas surrounded by social justice warriors at one of the most liberal, liberal progressive universities in Canada. I actually went to uh, Wilfrid Laurier for my undergrad. And it's, it's a university that's actually known for a big scandal. I don't know if you've heard about it, but basically uh, there was a girl, uh, she was probably a third year student, a young woman in maybe her third year or possibly second year, but she was a TA and she was uh, a teaching assistant for, for a critical thinking class. And for one of the modules, she decided to show a Jordan Peterson clip. And then her supervisor, who, you know, funnily enough, was, was a, a Daisy dude, pulled her up and started lying to her about how it caused trauma in the students. And it was a, it was akin to showing uh, Nazism or footage of Nazis. And she was kind of like bewildered and shocked, but she was recording it secretly because she understood that this was going south. He was not going to be fair. And she was basically being bullied, intellectually bullied and politically bullied by her supervisor. It was, um, it's ironic. She's a female as well. And he's a male. And it's imagine, imagine the irony of that dynamic, right? And he's probably thinking that I'm, I'm going to rescue, 
I'm going to rescue her from her own, her own internalized misogyny because I show, she showed a Jordan Peterson video where she doesn't know any better, which is, which is interesting because it's, that is a covert form of misogyny. And she ev eventually pushes back. Uh, she goes to the university um, uh, staff, other, other university staff, and she tries to get their help, but they're all siding with this supervisor. But then she basically tells them that if they're not fair, she will basically go to other uh, authorities, news outlets, etc., with the clip that she recorded. And so that's what she ends up doing. It goes viral and the university has no choice but to eventually buckle to the pressure. And then that, that uh, supervisor was put on leave. So that happened when I was, uh, I think I had just graduated or something like that. But when I found out about it, I was like, man, it, this makes sense of so much of what I went through going here because it was very difficult to actually have these discussions that we're having right now. Like the, the MSAs would have been deeply painted by like a, a woke culture, right? Wokeism was completely infiltrating our Muslim students associations and all other campus clubs. So I had a lot of time to think about your question. What were the, 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 the core contradictions between feminism and Islam? And it occurred to me that at first I thought they were just fiqh related, you know, things like, I don't want to, I struggle to accept that you have to obey your husband. But it turns out that unlike a lot of the skeptics who, who, who said, no, no, this is, this is just, you know, alarmism. It turns out, no, it's not alarmism. It also affects people's creeds. It affects how they view the prophets upon whom and messengers upon whom be peace and blessings, including the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can find Muslimas who pose as so-called relationship coaches, sex coaches, sacred womb healers, all kinds of nonsense that I have receipts of. And I regularly publish these receipts and they will, without any background in any kind of Islamic learning with, uh, you know, grounded authorities, they'll be running their mouths about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deferring to Sayyida Khadija anha. they'll describe her as quote, his boss, end quote and if, if they studied some of the classical texts on how, how we should maintain adab for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if they understood how the Malikis in North Africa, how, how severely they treated uh, blasphemous utterances, which, which would include things like disrespect for the Prophet Sallallahu they'd be shaking, you know. But why do they talk like this? Why why has it even reached this point where when they describe the best of creation Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they use such careless, disparaging language that's not even factually accurate. It's not even accurate, right? And this showed me that we have a serious problem on our hands because what feminism has led to, to today in 2023 is it has opened the door to completely inverting the correct order of, of beliefs and practices, even in Islam, even the framing of prophets and messengers upon whom be, be peace and blessings. Like one page I saw, subhanAllah, bro, it was, it was devastating. There was a, a, a again, coach. She was talking about, you know, not being ashamed of your sexual desires that they're natural. So you, you might be thinking, okay, maybe she's onto something here. But what does she end up doing? She ends up completely sabotaging whatever good intention she may, may have had by bringing in the story of Sayyidina Yusuf a.s. and Zuleika, uh, where um, Zuleika felt temptation for Sayyidina Yusuf a.s. And she basically uh, sexually harassed him right, behind closed doors and falsely accused him. And she turned that into, this was a case of mutual, mutual attraction. And Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, she, he didn't blame her for her natural feelings. He took, he took responsibility for his own mistakes. These are her words. I have, I have the, the receipts. And, and what did you see in the comments? Women commenting with, I've never heard this version. Wow. I've only heard the, the version where the woman was being blamed. Uh, this is so much more refreshing. Not one of them thought to fact checked, right? So what this shows is the bar for spreading nonsense is very, very low. You can do it easily as long mm. as you just appeal to the, the, the nafs of people. In this case, a lot of young women who have unfortunately been manipulated 
and, you know, spoiled into embracing these very destructive beliefs and uh, ways of, of living. So these are, these, con these are contradictions of a creedal nature, because not only are you rejecting practices, you're, you're fundamentally uh, distorting some of the most sacred pillars of our, our religion, how we frame the prophets, their infallibility, mm -hmm. how we frame the messengers, their infallibility, how we, how we frame the Qur'an, the Qur'anic account, right? Which is very clear. So these are contradictions, right? And I'm mentioning these ones instead of all the other, you know, other, others that are very obvious, like, for example, rejecting the natural hierarchy uh, in, in marriage. Some going as far as rejecting a hadith altogether because they were never told that there are numerous authentic hadith that really, really cause a, a, an identity crisis in a lot of these young women when they find out that they exist. Right? And I have a whole bunch of them that we could go through. And if they were to be understood correctly, if, if young women were to be socialized to be in accordance with their own fitra, to understand how masculinity serves them and how femininity serves men in, a, in an interdependent, beautiful, harmonious, symbiotic relationship, mm. they would understand what our grandmothers and centuries of women understood. Yes. Right. Because Islam is very complementarian. It has a necessary right. hierarchy. But when you look at all of the teachings from the Quran and the Sunnah with regards to gender relations, with regards to husband and wife, with regards to roles and responsibilities, with regards to hierarchy and all of these things, when you see the picture, you see harmony, you see that it's based it's designed in a way to have a functioning society right. that is Allah-centric, yeah, Absolutely. is God-centric. And what some of these feminists do, they'll zoom, zoom in on a particular verse or hadith, and they'll be like, well, this is wrong, or we should reframe it in a way that you cannot, but they'll try and reframe it through some kind of crazy hermeneutics, or just by suspending it and rejecting, rejecting it altogether by citing some context that, you know, they insert, right? Uh, and they're doing that because they already have non-negotiable ideological um, uh, frame of reference. They have a non-negotiable ideological assumptions, which is based on the feminist discourse, which would be women and men are exactly the same, for example. I know that sounds crude, but a lot of them actually would argue that right. we're exactly the same. Therefore, we must be treated exactly equally, which is really a form of oppression because we know that you know the man the man and the woman are not the same not only from a sharia perspective but from a biological psychological anthropological right. perspective and treating two different things that are the same is uh, in the same way is actually a form of injustice right um so really the irony is you know they feel that you know these masculine hierarchies are you know forms of injustice and the oppressing women and maybe therefore the whole of society well it's the other way around they are they want us to be oppressed they want society to be oppressed they want Absolutely. men and women to be oppressed because they they're starting with an oppressive assumption which is we're both the same we're both equal therefore treat us the same which is ridiculous yeah and some forms of feminism actually articulate that and i'm only using that as an example to show the kind of creedal friction right, right. So, let's just be let's be empathic here yeah you have a woman a sister She's brought up in a kind of Canadian Desi household. She doesn't really know much about Islam, bro. She doesn't know much about Tawheed, the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She doesn't know maybe, you know, why should she should even believe in Islam. She doesn't know much about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam no, about his life. She doesn't know much about Aqidah. She doesn't know much about the importance of referring back to the classical scholars and to, you know, the source text of Islam, namely the Quran and the Son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, her deen, her religion is more kind of a basic and intuitive from the point of view that she lives in a Desi household. They happen to be Muslim. They pray five times a day because you know it's spiritual, it makes sense. I'm connecting with my Creator. These things are wonderful, but everything else is kind of mixed with culture. For instance, there may be some what they would see as 
oppressive forms of culture. For example, I, I've done this on my YouTube channel, which in some Desi cultures, unfortunately, they don't you know, practice Islamic rules of inheritance. They actually give women nothing, right, which is not Islamic. So they'll see that as, oh, this is oppression. Um, then they'll basically, you know, have other issues at home, whether it's violence or whether it's, you know, being unjust with regards to ethics and norms that you treat, you know, the boys in a particular way, but women in, in a different way. And yes, obviously there are differences, but when it comes to things like rulings, like zina, fornication and so on and so forth, it's one rule for, for the boys and one rule for the girls. So they're starting to grow up in that environment, right? And then they go into university. And then when they're in university, they have the kind of secular friends. And, you know, because we have a need to belong, this is part of social conformity. We have a need to belong. So we're going to try to connect with our, with our peers, even if they're not Muslim. You know, mm -hmm. they let me pray. Maybe I could wear my hijab. But I like these people. I feel a sense of, you know, maybe liberation and connection with them. And they start getting these ideas and they're thinking, hold on a second, I don't know much about Islam, but this happens at home and this happens at home and this doesn't right. feel right. And what happens is when they want to raise their voice, there isn't a community behind them to give the Islamic paradigm sometimes, I'm assuming. And obviously I'm saying this in a way just to push back a bit so we could get an answer. Sure, sure. And then they're like, okay, well, feminism says treat women okay, you know, uh, no oppression. And right. I love Islam, I pray, but I got this crazy culture going on and I see some things that, you know, don't make much sense and uh, they seem quite oppressive to me. And, you know, sometimes culture, when it doesn't align with Islam, is very problematic. And then they're like, okay, I'm going to latch onto this thing called feminism now and I need an Islamic feminism, right? When a, a sister who's been brought up in that kind of context that I just discussed, which, to be honest, if we travel the world, many sisters are brought up in that context. How, how do we go about empathizing, em, having an empathic intelligence with them and at the same time not compromising on the deen and our values and bringing them closer to orthodoxy? So obviously that assumes that this goes on. And what it also assumes is that sometimes we got it wrong in terms of the men, the way we, we, we were very overtly ideological with individual sisters where we should be ideological with the group and the ideology itself, but with individual sisters, we see them sometimes as, you know, the, the bastions of the feminist ideology, which sometimes is not the case. She's just a mesquine sister who's been brought up right. in a very crazy environment. We need to maybe show a little bit more empathy with her. And, and how do we give dawah to her, basically? How do we bring her into the paradigm of Islam, the Quran, the Sunnah, orthodoxy, understanding these necessary more hierarchies? Because sometimes I think... Um, we sometimes may lack that empathic intelligence. Absolutely, with absolutely. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yeah? I totally understand. I totally understand. And it's very interesting because I've, I've had female clients who have come from very, very, very uh, abusive households where the father was a, a nut job, right? One in particular who had this story. Uh, and I know of other stories. They weren't from female clients per se, but they were cases I, I intervened in. And they had similar themes of, a failing on the part of the men in their lives. And this mm -hmm. will naturally encourage or facilitate the, the, the moral corruption of the woman because it will make it easier for her to find validation in the wrong places. And this is something men have known for a long time. And when they lack masculine, a masculine backbone and, 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 a, and the correct masculine constitution, they will, in fact destroy and damage the women in their lives mm. but what people forget is the men who are doing this come in two two broad forms right there's the archetype of the simp the word that has been made popularized across the the, the internets right through meme culture and whatnot and i'll define by the way for yeah. interjection by the way what i've just said the yeah. brothers out there that would call me a simp for just saying this. You know that, yeah? Absolutely. And I, I call them... Crazy. By the way, I, I, I want to tweet this, but I'll say it out loud. Call me what you want, but please do it, in, do it to my face. I'll give you a thousand pounds to say it in front of my face if you're one meter away from me. And that's my challenge to brothers who, who use those terms because I would just hold them and just teach yeah, them a yeah. lesson. 100% they wouldn't. And, 100 and I would, they... I would, if they, if they yeah. want to call me that, I'll give them a thousand pounds 
if they could say it within one meter. <laughs> here's a thousand pounds and here's an uppercut. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's, okay, maybe that's hyperbolic, but the thing is, that's why sometimes we use those slogans in a very inappropriate way. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But anyway, continue with, with what you're but, saying. You know, when I use them, I use them in a surgical way. I value yeah, yeah, sure, sure, for sure, right? for sure. And and they do have very real manifestations that I believe dominate the status quo much more than their misuse. Like they they have, they are misused, but the correct application of that term is represented by much 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 more mainstream stuff going on. Right? We can point to a lot of stuff showing that there is such a thing as simping and it's unhealthy and it actually doesn't serve. So those who don't reason. know, what does what does simping mean? Okay, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. It doesn't serve the fifth three interests of women, right? When I say the word simp, I'm getting at a codependent male. There's a book by Dr. Robert Glover called No More Mr. Nice Guy. And he talks about a condition called nice guy syndrome, which is an extension of codependency in men, where you have men who lack a strong sense of self, a clear sense of self, and a genuine commitment to uh, authentic principles, and they lack a capacity for true intimacy because they can actually express their genuine frame or their genuine set of principles, their mm. true thoughts and feelings, their true expectations. So what they're doing is they're always trying to be your shadow because they think that's the key to relationships. I, I'll, get, I'll get a good relationship if I beg for approval. And I'll get uh, approval in the best way from women if they let me sleep with them. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that from them get access to them, even if it means violating my own principles. And ironically, they find that that doesn't help them at all. It does the complete opposite. It destroys the basis of attraction. It, de it, it destroys the basis of intimacy. Sure. And they will even encourage the corruption of their women folk or women in society because they don't actually care about what is in the best long-term interests of women. They don't care about guiding women to uh, the best hereafter state. They just care about short-term gratification through approval. And that is simping, right? You're violating the truth and principle because you want approval. And that is insincere. It violates the very foundations of, of Islamic manhood, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're not simping for being truthful and being honest in highlighting a genuine problem that some women are actually facing. That's also part of Islamic manhood, right? So you would say that, you, you're talking about the two types of masculinity or being a male, right? And you're saying well, the, that the the two types of, of dysfunctional masculinity that cause these problems. Yes, good. Them. So yeah. one of them is simping. Yeah? One of them is a simp archetype, right? An archetype is just a model. A Would that include as well, like you know, I, I I I don't know, I don't want to offend anybody, right? But I you know, I have my views on this. Like, there's a lot of brothers out there that seem quite practicing, and their wives are all over the social media. Yep. Like, what's what's with that? It's, it's a devastating uh, condition. It's a devastating condition. And I want to actually cite something. It's a hadith Please. that relates to what we're talking about very well. And this is related by Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. He related that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, how will you be, O people, when your women transgress the bounds and your youth are morally corrupted. They said, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will that come to pass? He said, Yes, and even worse, how will you be when you forsake the enjoining of good and the forbidding of evil? They said, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will that come to pass? He said, Yes, and even worse, how will you be when you come to see evil as good and good as evil? SubhanAllah. Inversion. And some uh, scholars of hadith class, this is a weak hadith, and others, they, they still narrate it and they relate because a weak hadith is not a fabricated one, but there are many like this that are stronger and they, they essentially convey the same meaning, right? Hmm. And so here, what we're being shown is that morality in Islam and in, in, in the case of being a good masculine man, it's not mutually exclusive from setting limits, right? The, the, the religion involves limits. And being a, a righteous authority, a righteous caretaker, a righteous steward, a righteous provider requires also applying, enforcing boundaries, defining them, and then applying them and enforcing them to the degree necessary, right? And you have to exercise yeah. wisdom. So, 
So basically, a simp would not have any red lines. They would have no, no principles that they would enforce. Right. And basically, they could not be defined as a masculine figure that would enforce these red lines and have these principles to be implied to themselves and right. to the women folk. Right. And the reason for that is because they're like Machiavellian from that perspective, right? Uh, the I'm ends just by the means. And the ends for them is I just want her to sleep with me or I want some form of pleasure from the woman. And you right. will throw, you know, you would use any means to achieve that, which means throwing away moral principles, Islamic principles, throwing away, you know, what it means to be a caretaker, to have an authority over your women folk. It, that does, that's all nonsense for that person because they, all they see is I want pleasure. In this case, they want some form of sexual pre uh, pleasure. They want some, you know, form of, um, you know, affirmation from them that, oh, you're so wonderful. I love you to bits and all of that stuff. Some kind of, you know, you know, uh, to be at so-called uh, good terms with them, irrespective of any principles, irrespective of what Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam want that, wants that man to implement in his home. Okay, we get that. Absolutely. So you're saying that is a distortion of Islamic masculinity and that's one of the causes for why some women basically seek feminism. Is that what you're saying? They seek the dominant frame, the authority, the only remaining authority around them. Whatever is the cultural authority, the political authority, the economic authority. And in this case, that is feminism because it is very interesting. Right? It is the dominant form. That, that would um, also mean, therefore, this is not a, this is not a cause for for feminism, but this will this this may facilitate feminism. This facilitates. It's interesting it. because if they're looking for the dominant frame now, and the, if the dominant frame is feminism, then they're going to latch onto that, which right. means that feminism is also part of the problem. It's part of the cause. It's part of the problem. Good. And Good. you know what's interesting? I don't, think, I don't want people to think that oh, bad Muslim men or men who don't follow prophetic masculinity, they are causing feminism. No, they're causing uh, uh, the need for their women folk to seek a dominant frame because right. you don't have a dominant right. frame at home. You don't and have a dominant because frame. In, and because in today's society, the dominant frame is feminism, they latch onto it. So we're not saying right. it causes feminism. It may facilitate these women to attach to the current Absolutely. dominant frame, which is yes. feminism. Therefore, feminism is also the cause of the problem. Right, right. Okay, and this is especially highlighted by the fact that you had you had forms of suffering of women historically when patriarchy was universally a norm in virtually every major civilization. And you didn't have women in those times seeking refuge in a feminism, even if they were being abused, because it didn't exist as a dominant frame culturally. Right. Very interesting. So very. What, what do do? Well, I'm learning here. This is this is very interesting. This oh, yeah. is this is good stuff. This this is. Like, I'm gonna use this. <laughs> this is really. Good. 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 Well, I bless um, you. So, okay. I mean, now, so you, this was you gave an example one of the distortions of Islamic masculinity. What was the other one you wanted to talk the about? The other one would be so the first one we're highlighting that it this is a person a man a male. Let's let's be real. He's a male. He has not become a man. He has not been socialized. He has not been trained into manhood, right? Because manhood has biological, but also social functions. And yes. when those social functions are congruent with a man's biological design and his spiritual purpose, then he has realized masculinity, right? All three yes. dimensions are in harmony. But the simp guy, he hasn't done that. He's, he's not even on his way. Then you have the tyrant archetype, right? He's a guy who has authority to some degree, meaning he can assert his lines, he can assert his expectations, his thoughts and feelings, but they're wrong or often are wrong and they often aren't meeting the needs of his women folk, right? So he's seen as a tyrant, a selfish person, an oppressor. And he's a leader in the sense that he is at the top in the hierarchy, but he's not just. And when you're living under him, you don't feel good. You don't feel good not even in the long term. And this can get tricky because not feeling good under a leader is not evidence that you're being oppressed universally, right? That has to be understood. If that was true, then every single child who throws a tantrum when their father says it's, it's your bedtime would be able to say my dad's oppressive or he's not giving me candy. So he's oppressive, 
right? We, we can apply the same logic to women who may not necessarily feel good. It's natural for many women not to feel good when perfectly reasonable and shari compliant lines are being applied in a society where that's no longer normal. When those same women, they, they would have grandmothers who would be like, well, what's the problem? I don't understand, right? But I'm talking about a case where we can actually qualify that the lines of this tyrant are not aligned with the Sharia. He's violating the Sharia. He's, he's violating his responsibilities. He lacks competence in actually meeting the needs of his women folk, or he doesn't care to at all. But what he mm -hmm. can do is he can throw his weight around, right? And this guy, unfortunately, will still have more success with women than the simp. And, and having to choose between these two is a, is a devastating problem in and of itself. It represents the fracturing of masculinity in the West, where you, it's as if you have to be one or the other. The bad boy, irresponsible bad boy, who might be a tyrant in, in relationships, but has a so-called sexual edge because he, because he can still apply some level of authority and magnetism. Or the hopeless, romantic, nice guy who women just friend zone because they can't generate attraction they can't polarize that woman they see him as as effeminate like them so they see him as just one of the girls frankly speaking so how would how would the tyrant masculine um archetype that you're talking about now yeah. how would that basically push some sisters to the dominant frame which is feminism so what may happen is they may have a rebounding effect where you'll, you'll notice women who are usually with this this archetype they generalize their experiences with him to all men, even though the vast majority of men in the millennial generation and amongst Gen Z guys, they're actually sexless. They're not experiencing relationships amongst yes. non-Muslims, right? A lot of research has shown this, especially when it's, uh, when you study dating, uh, the dating market trends on certain dating apps. And, and the trends are very similar across most of the apps. So the guys who are actually getting their girls, they may be doing things that are wrong, but they're a tiny minority and the vast majority of women who experience these guys, they tend to project those bad experiences onto all the other guys, right? And what happens is once they experience the tyranny from him, they might seek a softer touch, right, for a period. And then they might go back to him, rebound, or someone like him. And then they might escape back into a softer touch. And then they might go searching for that, that guy again, or, or, or someone like him. And it's a very unhealthy form of self-sabotage. You're just like a ping pong ball. And, and she has no actual guardian taking care of her, protecting her from that dynamic. That's what feminism has done for her in its popular. Uh, I see. So right? that, that would push her to what you call the dominant frame, the stable frame, which is feminism, right? right. Um, which is very interesting. Now, look, one would argue as well that, you know, a lot of these guys who are like simps, maybe we can't blame them that much because the education system is feminized. The, the kind of social architecture of modern Western society is actually anti-male. And there's an argument for this. So, yeah. you know, would you, what would be your thoughts about that? I, I, I have to empathize with them. I have to empathize with all people, including the women folk, because our society is broken. You know, we, we, ha we are living in a dysfunctional age. We are living in dysfunctional times. There's that Daisy girl archetype you're talking about. There's the Daisy, the Daisy boy who I saw growing up. I saw him in myself. I saw him in so many men around me, less, to a much lesser degree in myself because I, I had a father who, who had both a backbone and who was a selfless provider. He was both the head of the household and he was a generous provider that and a caretaker. Him. Alhamdulillah. And he took care of all of his sisters. You know, he, he was, my father was orphaned at age 12. He had his mother, but he was the oldest son. He lost his father. He had to pull up his socks, if you, you know, as the saying goes, and he had to become the guardian. And he had numerous little sisters. He, he raised them up. He got them through their, their primary schooling. And my great uncle, which was his, his paternal uncle, stepped in and he, he, he founded the very first school that provided education for boys and girls in, in their village. Okay. Right? And he got his sisters through that. His, my, my great uncle, my dad's paternal uncle, he helped with that process. And then my dad got all of his sisters married before he got himself married. He purposely delayed his own marriage so that he could get his sisters 
married first. And he, and he vetted each and every single one of the men who all turned out to be great men. They're my uncles. Wow. And, you know, they, they all, many of them were, they served in the army at some point or they were, they were leaders in, in different capacities. And what I saw in them was this holistic understanding of traditional masculinity where you're not, you're not, you're not uh, fracturing it and fragmenting it into the simp or the, the, the jerk. Yes. And that's children. why, that's why, and you know, may Allah bless your father, bro. And I mean, is your father alive? He's alive. Well, I love him. And, you know, I think uh, what you're doing is a great testament to his hard work. And may Allah grant him all of the reward of the work that you do and Amen. grant him, you know, the highest level of Jannah, of paradise and Amen. bless Amen. your family. And I would love to meet him when I come to Canada. It would be great to shake his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah. I would love for you to meet him too. I congratulate him on, on uh, amazing work with his family and, and specifically with yourself. May Allah bless you. So Amen. look, bro, this is why we need prophetic masculinity. And now, generally speaking, you know, I've done this, I think, a few videos before about masculinity. Sometimes we miss out the internal element, right? Because some people think masculine is always just, you know, pro, you know, just enforcing that masculine frame, which is very important, having those red lines and those principles, ensuring that right. there's, a, there's that more hierarchy, ensuring that balance, ensuring that Allah-centric uh, family unit you know with necessary hierarchies and roles and responsibilities and within that you have a sense of helm forbearance and compassion but also assertiveness when needed right. right the point is a lot of people also miss the internal aspects right because for me prophetic masculinity is also about being able to bench press your ego right it's able to basically make sure you're not someone who is has kibber or hasad or ostentation riya or ujub, self amazement, and these things sometimes is, is it's not, it's I don't think it's emphasized enough in the kind of masculinity discourse because a lot of these things, having a masculine frame, being nice, being kind, being compassionate, being courageous, being assertive, enforcing your red lines, you know, establishing that more necessary familial and more hierarchy. That is a derivative of your state of heart, right? Absolutely. And, to do, and you know, from a prophetic perspective, to be a man is to, is to do with that internal element, which I want to discuss in a few moments. But before we talk about prophetic masculinity, what on earth is red pill, man? What is this? What's going on? <laughs> What's red pill? Sure. sure. Uh, before we touch on this, may I backtrack just yes, for a few minutes, yes, right? Really. Because I wanted to add that what you said about the plight of boys today and how they, they are socialized into that simp archetype, it is very much a systematic problem. And so when I when I use that term, I'm not using it to mock uh, men today. I'm using it descriptively. I'm using it to characterize a condition that mm -hmm. has become normalized, right? And one that we need to be self-aware about if we want to deal with it within ourselves and, and in others. And the same would go for the tyrant archetype. I'm in Canada, and in most places in Canada, we don't have as many of the, the, the tyrannical archetypes because Canada is a much more liberal society. I know yes, in the yes. UK, it's different in, in, in many um, closed communities where you've, you've preserved a sort of conservatism, even if it was a dysfunctional one, mm. you have more of those roadman wannabe types, right? And so the medicine for them is different than the medicine for the one who is struggling with that simping archetype and the yes, pathologies sir. of that that come with that right so people need to understand this you have to be honest about who you are because you cannot become a man without honesty without congruence self-awareness you need self-awareness self right and that goes doubly for the egotistical guys who think they're alpha most of the guys who come to me for help they're not they're not those guys they're the guys who struggled with a pattern of simping because they had they had at least enough of a brokenness to be humble they were self-aware of their brokenness enough to be humble to come to me. Yeah. Now, there are some guys who have that, actually many guys who still haven't made it to that humility. They have a covert form of narcissism. They're very much like the, the wannabe alpha on the inside, but on the outside, they're very weak. They're, they're, they're just covertly narcissistic. Mm -hmm. And the wannabe alphas can often be overtly narcissistic, right? They're both focused on the self. One of them, I find, yeah, yeah, I find a lot of the so-called alphas to be extremely weak. They are weak, absolutely. And, and, I, and, I, and I see right through it. I'm like, because yeah. you see in their reaction and their expression of wanting to dominate in certain contexts when you're thinking, 
a powerful man who knows himself and has the red lines and principles that he <clears> to enforce <throat> would never react in this situation, right? A in the way that you have. Right. Now, you're coming across as domineering, but in actual fact, it's basically veiling an internal pathology. Absolutely. And I think a lot of the so-called alphas today, they're brothers who basically had really bad relationships with their fathers. And I've seen this oh, pattern. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And that's why it's so important for, you know, brothers, you know, if they're fathers to be good role models. And I'm not just right. saying speaking, what you say, it's actually what you do because children, even young adults, they listen with the eyes, not with the ears. They look Absolutely. at your way of being and they want to emulate that way of being. So a lot of these brothers who come across as alphas, dominant, strong, domineering in, in wrong ways, react, reactionary in wrong ways, I see it as a pathology that's veiling, that it's, it's, it's a veil for an internal pathology. Um, and, you know, they need to be self-aware to realize that as well at the same time. Because, you know, you know I, I really believe, a, you know, to be uh, emulating prophetic masculinity is there is a lot of forbearance if it's not to do with your red lines. Right. Yeah? right. And we see this in the prophetic interaction, right, with his with his wife, Aisha, radiallahu anha, with, with other human beings. But when there's red lines, then you, 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 you become dominant, you assert that frame, you have those, you know, non-negotiable red lines that you enforce, right? Because if you don't enforce them, they're not red lines anymore, they're just uh, suggestions, right? right, right. So, um, and, you know, my dad actually would speak about this, you know, my dad would say, you know, may Allah guide him, right? That he would say, I like, mean, it's, he called it love and law. So like this square or rectangle. So you have your law, your red principles, your red lines. And within that, there's lots of compassion and forbearance. Right, yeah? right. Anything happens, right, that crosses that, square that red line whatever those red lines are obviously for us it's in line with the quran and the sunnah and and you know the way of the classical scholars and so on and so forth you then you enforce right um then you have that sense of you know uh, intellectual spiritual masculinity and courage and enforcement because this is your role now you have to maintain you know the moral boundaries and the principles yeah but a lot of the alphas they don't have they don't have those red lines they, everything is a red line sometimes, right? right. And they're very brittle, and therefore they can no break easily. There's no sense of forbearance. There's no sense of, right. you know, uh, actually emulating the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everything is about a reaction and dominance sometimes, right. right? Right. And that might sound like a crude representation, but I think people are trying. I'm trying to make people understand. Yeah. What yeah. So I, okay, I do yeah. find that to be true that the the guys who have that simple archetype, they usually they're usually guys who had domineering mothers. They have a wound oh, relationship really? with mother. Interesting. Yeah. If you look at, if you actually look at the CIA, CIA da uh, database on sexual, sexually perverse serial killers amongst males, almost all of them have had a narcissistic mother. Wow. And they, they felt emasculated and castrated and they became extremely dysfunctional uh, adults. They were not able to so be, uh, be, be socialized into functional adults. Now, it's not, it's not to say that every guy in that case is going to turn out that way, but the probability does increase, right? Yes, and, yes. and you will definitely still have baggage to deal with. Um, and I do find that men who, who are closer to their aggression can be trained into softness if they open their heart. But it's hard for a guy who's very, very weak, deeply socially anxious, and who feels deeply effeminate or emasculated to develop strength later in life when he was not shown how to as a boy or in, in, in his teens, right? Which has become a modern, modern category of life. But it's a lot harder, but it can be done. It's just you have to bring them from a very, very inverted place of weakness into strength. And you have to take the guy who's a bit too rough around the edges from being unpolished, but he has strength into a refined spirituality. Right. Very and interesting. Very he might interesting. the guy who's more raw. I found that they tend to still have a level of realness to them, because they're not distancing themselves from the intimacy of their experiences and the raw feedback they got from the, the street mm -hmm. life. Whereas a lot of guys who get they they fall into the nerdy way, and I was like this growing up. At some points, you can become disconnected from what you're genuinely experiencing. You can become a robotic, monotone, fake, masked person who thinks he's virtuous. And, and this is why a lot of, uh, of uh, literature in Tasawwuf warns the intellect 
Don't think you're you're too smart. Don't 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 think you're spiritually ascended when you're disconnected from many realities, including your heart. Right. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. So this has to be understood just because a lot of people today who talk about this in the academic world, I find that they're very disconnected from the ground realities. They're not they're not congruent just because they can talk fancy. They're not being honest about their own genuine state. Right. Yes. And, and that plays into these dynamics because it goes back to self-awareness. You can't evaluate where you are in your masculine development if you lack that self-awareness. And the more masks you wear, the harder it's going to be for you to do that. Right. Wow. This is so red pill. What red is pill. this? Pill. What is this, this movement? What on earth is red pill? I know that a lot of people are intrigued, especially for this section. We've had a lot of grifters, a lot of coaches, a lot of different commentators jump onto the scene, especially in COVID. I noticed that because I've actually been doing this work from 2012 onwards. And I do remember that in that time period, no one cared about this stuff. Like in my community, no one even knew any of this stuff. And all of a sudden, I think towards the end of 2019, it just blew up. And I was like, whoa, I, I never saw this coming. I thought that this is going to stay like a very niche underground movement. But it turns out that the industry that I've been working in and these underground movements, they got a lot more exposure than I ever expected. And to understand the red pill, someone who is on the outside of these movements really needs to understand the manosphere. And the manosphere is basically a, an underground collection of what used to be forums, uh, websites, and different men's interest groups, including MRAs, who are men's rights activists, MGTOW, who were MRAs who had the, a certain philosophy of, of how to solve the, the problems that the MRAs identified as the oppression of men. So the MGTOW said, we have our own view of how to deal with that. They, they stand for men going their own way. Then number three, you had the PUAs, the pickup artist community, right? Those who proclaim to be dating experts, how, you know, they, they, they proclaim they could help the average Joe attract women and improve his, his romantic life. They identified problems in a lot of average middle-class men who struggled in romantic relationships because they were growing up in a post-feminist era, right? The nature of society has changed dr uh, dramatically. Uh, the legal system itself has shifted from a, what used to be a patriarchal one to a post-feminist one. Right? It's not like you can go to a judge and be like, I'm the, I'm the wali of my wife. Good luck <laughs> doing that in a Western court. Right. And so these guys didn't understand how to actually form uh, romantic relationships. They often didn't understand how to even form deep friendships with other men. They were growing up in a post Homer Simpson era where you have men, you know, framed as like a dumb bumbling buffoon of a dad. He's not threatening at all. He's not, he's got no, no edge to him. He's not sharp. He's not a leader. He has no frame whatsoever. And so the pickup artist guys, they were trying to figure out how can they reclaim some aspects of masculinity which are attractive to women. And this was actually starting in the 90s. A lot of people don't know that. But this, this kind of stuff started in the 90s. And then in, in the early to the late 2000s, they started getting more and more well-developed. I think somewhere around 2005 to 2010, in, that, in those five years, I think a lot of blogs that were specifically connected to the red pill movement developed. And these ones were started by pioneering thinkers like, you know, Rolo Tomasi, who goes by the rational male on YouTube and a few others. Uh, one of them, his name was, I think, Hartiste. And then a bunch of others who basically said, you know what? The reason why we men are all gathering in these spaces is because we live in a time where masculinity has been subverted. And this happened ever since the uh, sexual revolution hijacked the feminist movement and it introduced birth control technologies that, and other kinds of technologies that fundamentally changed the very nature of relationships, biology, uh, the discipline that used to exist between men and women and, and relationships and so on and so forth. And the many, many legal shifts that occurred that led to a lot of abuses of men in family courts uh, uh, during divorce cases where a lot of guys were just, they were getting cleaned. They were getting cleaned 
They were getting uh, uh, completely mischaracterized after no fault divorces were introduced. Many were, many of them were losing complete custody of their children. They didn't even get they didn't even get partial shared custody, and it led them to deep depression. Like they had been providers, and they had been steady. They had been following the blueprint of, of Western societies, post-feminist masculinity. Be a good be a good man. In quotes, be a nice guy, be a good man, provide. And it didn't work out. And so Rolo and, and others like him, they said, this isn't working for us. We are being lied to. There is a gynocracy, which is a, 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 an oppressive, oppressive state of affairs dominated by the whims and, and imbalances and delusions that come from only prioritizing the female imperative what women want in this particular liberal society. And so the red pill movement became a way of liberating guys from the shackles they found themselves in. And so pilling itself became known as a way of awakening. It went back to the matrix. And even there were, I think there were, there was a series even before the matrix where the red and blue pill were introduced. The blue pill was the dominant frame of society, which was aligned with the gynocracy, right? Lying to the guys, defanging them, emasculating them, keeping them as at best good workers and providers, but with absolutely no headship, no authority. You're gonna be a provider, but you're not gonna have headship. Whereas historically in most patriarchal societies, especially Islamic ones, and even many Western ones and European ones, there was an understanding that authority and responsibility must be paired together. If you have authority without responsibility, you have tyranny. If you have a, a responsibility in the, in the form of, of male service and stewardship without authority, you are enslaved as a man, right? And the Prophet ﷺ in his, in his farewell pilgrimage sermon did not describe men as captives unto women. We have to remember that. The Prophet ﷺ told men to treat their women folk with care because they are like captives unto you mm. and you you cannot treat them uh, otherwise unless you see flagrant immorality which means there was there was hikma and instruction given on how you can be corrective if yes. you see bad behavior right which is something that these guys in the west were, weren't taught so they were like okay if we can't correct bad behavior we're not even allowed to identify it because we're oppressors by default somehow and women can do whatever they want and the legal system is now in, is facilitating that and all the blueprints that society disney and hollywood are giving us in terms of actually how, you know succeeding with women are failing and we're falling into crippling debt and we're we're breaking our backs trying to stand and we can't do it the red pill was offered to them to escape what was defined as the blue pill misery that they had they were looking through society through this deceptive lens an emasculated lens the blue pill and they were offered the red pill which was supposed to liberate them into true manhood true emancipation so that's more of like the the the, the origins of the red pill movement. that's your origins which is fair enough right because the way you've described it you know it was inevitable for something to, to, right you know something to change right right now the question here is well what are the kind of i don't know what are the you feel like the five pillars or the, the, <laughs> so, the, one, the red 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 pillars like what do they actually say right because i've heard things like it's about sexual dynamics it's about having a masculine frame some right. of the things i've heard sound all right other things that i've heard some of the red pillars say could be bordering kufr yeah i'm Absolutely. thinking what's going on here so what are the kind of main tenets of the, the, the Red Pill movement? So the Red Pill movement that we know of, like feminism, has become a populist movement that in many ways has morphed into different forms. So when you look at on, on YouTube, you see like Fresh and Fit. You see Sneeko, who I believe is converted. I have to, I'm not sure about that, but if, if that's the case, mashallah. Yeah, he became Muslim. Muslim. He became Muslim, alhamdulillah, mashallah. And you see the Kevin Samuels, uh, types, right? There are overlapping points of view and, and, and models of analysis 
and then there are very very uh, diverging ones. So, for example, you can break it in. You can break your analysis of the red pill into descriptive understanding their descriptive claims and understanding their prescript prescriptive claims. And it's the latter where they're going to disagree with on a lot. What is, what is the actual solution moving forwards is where you'll see a lot of uh, disagreement. Descriptively, most of them are, are going to agree on most of the basics. You know, um, hypergamy is a fact and they'll define hypergamy in a very narrow way. They'll define it purely in terms of status and in terms of wealth. But I have a, a very different understanding and view of hypergamy that I believe is much stronger and closer to the Islamic uh, tradition which we'll get into when we talk about green pill. And they also agree on intersexual dynamics, basic things like, hmm, well, sexual, sexual attraction works in a certain way where the man has to be in the leading frame and the woman has to be in the following frame. Otherwise, that will get in the way of intersexual dynamics, attraction. Um, they'll agree on things that are things I contest, like, certain generalizations about female nature and male nature based on poor sample sizes like a liberal Western context, bad experiences mm -hmm. in the West. You've never lived in a 12th century uh, lands of, of, the, of the Arabs. What, what do you know about human nature? You're, you're, you're basing it off of very, very recent history and recent history after birth control technology, which alters women's uh, brain chemistry and even their hormones so this is something they overlook but they agree on it they agree that their views of human nature are solid some of them do try to source pre-modern history pre-modern patterns right they'll agree on on some of those um they'll also agree on things like polygamy being inherent to male nature um they'll they'll so they'll agree that polygamy is inherent to male nature and hypergamy is inherent to female nature, right? That women women have a tendency to marry up or, or choose mates who are higher in hierarchy. And they define that in terms of resource-based status. You've got a lot more money. You have a lot more stuff, fancy cars, houses, or any historical equivalents, land, lots of sheep, horses. Uh, you, have, you have an armed militia. You have a good reputation, right? And they would probably also agree on the fact that this is an irreversible problem, that Western society is at a point where the gynocracy has reached an irreversible stage and each person will have to figure out what they do about that. How, how, how will they contend with that? Others who are you know, specific personalities like Rolo, recently they've published things that are very strange. They take a, a, a huge departure from what they used to write back in the early 2000s. Um, but which show that this is what happens when you're not grounded in a, in a sound dean, right? He's, I think he put up a list on Twitter where he's like, these were his prescriptions. You have to be in shape. You have to avoid getting married. Um, he, he mentioned something about render, your, render yourself infertile so you can't have kids, right? And he mentioned a bunch of other things. Like there was only one or two points on that list that were sound. And the rest were very strange, like don't have children, don't marry, right? And so on and so forth. And enjoy a lot of promiscuous sex outside of marriage. And so this is where a lot of others debated him, including Sneeko. They had a, a live on Fresh and Fit's uh, show where they, they took him to task for that. And he was trying to say that, these, oh, these weren't prescriptive points. These were, you know, and he just gave some soft, sophistic, you know, mumbo jumbo answer. And he, he fumbled and he didn't, he didn't give a clear explanation. And other things like, oh, you have to be a high value man, right? To make it in this society. These are all talking points of the red pill community. But what does it mean to be a high value man is something where they, where they do not have a, a clear consensus. Some of them will, some pockets will. And there are other, other schools of thought. They'll be like, well, you know what? Yeah, being physically fit, sure. But sleeping around, not necessarily. And this is where you have, you know, religious oriented followers of these spaces that will have their own views mm -hmm. or, or, or like the trad movement you have trad males and trad females who yes. have their own takes, right and with regards to the high value um definition it's quite interesting there's an emphasis on high value and people correlate that to things like 
economic and social status, which yeah. has a kind of ideological spin to it. Because if you live in a kind of neo-capitalist society, right, and you know, you live in a liberal society, then, you know, generally speaking, if that's your frame of reference and what you're going to consider as high value is maybe just material things and money and a certain right. position in a job, right? right? But you have a different worldview, a deen, like Islam, then high value also includes and must include, you know, your taqwa, your God consciousness, right. your a sense of elevated purpose it's not right. just about you know just your family but you have a vision you have an allah centric akhara centric vision for the world you have a lofty vision right? <clears throat> and, Absolutely. And, yes. and that's why you know we talk about high value but we're not talking about you know high morals right which i high, think is very important. Right. right so okay this is this is this is very interesting i know you're very nuanced because you're citing the fact that there are almost like different schools of thoughts from these you know, these issues and the need to have like an established deen, a kind of an aqidah, a kind of, you know, uh, worldview that is sound, which Islam right. provides, right. which we could talk about green pill in a few moments. Inshallah. So what you've said so far with regards to red pill, so would you say Islam and red pill are like compatible? So before I answer this, I also want to uh, add that the, the different schools of thought apply to feminism as well. But just like I said with feminism, there are underlying currents. Same thing with the, the red pill and the manosphere. The, their, their view of the gynocracy oppressing men and, and lying to them about masculine nature and feminine nature would be their, their fundamental pillar, right? So when it comes to Islam <clears throat> and whether it's compatible with the red pill, we can safely say that no uh, movement that originates independently of the Islamic tradition is going to be 100% compatible with it. By, very, by its very nature At best you're going to find overlapping uh, Points of agreement Based on shared observations right? Empirical studies right? Because in Islam we accept three main sources Of knowledge according to the, the majority of shuyuk This is well established You have textual uh, Revealed sources of, of, of knowledge That would include the consensus of scholars That would include the Quran and the Ahadith Literature and texts And then you have uh, observational sources of knowledge Which even non-Muslims will access And then you have The rational sources, reasoning, inferences Right? Mm -hmm. So wherever anyone Irrespective of if they're a feminist or a red pillar Can exercise Sound observations and inferences About something in reality They might, they might touch upon something that Coincides with something that we as Muslims can accept Right? For example, we can observe That there is no uh, legal or political sort of patriarchy that is relevant to the condition of the average middle class man in the West. You can just observe that. You can see that this is not in any way, shape, or form how the Muslims lived, right, with, within the context of having male authority. So if a red pillar says that, I can agree with that. Absolutely. If a feminist was to say, hmm, well, uh, there in this particular period of history in this region there were high cases of domestic violence against women and i actually look into that and i see that it's it's been factually reported okay what's there to what's there to reject it's where they interpret those observations we're gonna have problems or it's where their observations are poorly executed they're not experts they're just random guys and girls on mm -hmm. the internet they're not trained to you know exercise good observations so we need to doubly check first of all are their observations actually correct? Are they being meticulous? And then secondly, what are they drawing from those based on their ideological? Yeah, so they're going to they're gonna view these things from an ideological lens, but right. not just that. So we could agree with maybe empirical observations that have been made, and right. if they're done in a meticulous way, free from ideological baggage that skews the interpretation of right. the empirical data. Right. Uh, the issue here is, the solutions. We don't necessarily yeah. agree with the solutions because the, the solutions come from a, a deen, a worldview right. that is antithetical to the Islamic tradition. Now, there may be some things they may say, like, you know, make sure you have a masculine frame. That sounds good in abstraction. But what does that mean? How, how and when do you, and, you know, enforce that masculine frame? What does actually masculine mean in that particular context, right? There may be some overlaps, but the danger for me 
is when people say, you know, take the good, leave the bad, there is a <clears> big problem here. And the problem is, well, if you already know what the good is, to recognize the taking of the good and the leaving of the bad, then you don't need that then, right? Right. Think about right. it. If, if, if someone says, you take the good, leave the bad, well, I already have something that is the good. I understand a, what good is and I have a reference for good. So if I have that as a reference when I'm looking at something that is, doesn't come from Islam and I can now find out what is good and remove the bad, well, I don't really need fundamentally the thing that I'm assessing because I already have my own fr- reference. Why don't we ask a more fundamental question, which is, well, what does Islam say? What does our source of good say about these particular issues? Now, some people may disagree with me with this, but I think in the long term, it's far more better for our communities to start from a ground <clears throat> up. What does the right. Quran and the Sunnah and the scholars say about this particular issue? And we apply it in a contemporary way. If we have too much overlap, now, don't get me wrong, it's, you know, there, obviously you, you, you can gain knowledge and empirical insights and wisdoms from, you know, other worldviews, for sure. This is part of our tradition, you know, absolutely, what comes absolutely. to mind is a authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was asked by the Sahaba, the companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them, about cohabiting with a woman, woman who's breastfeeding, right? And... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, looked into, I think, the Persians or the Romans and he said it doesn't harm them. So he allowed the Sahaba to cohabit right. with the women folk that were basically, you know, him. breastfeeding. So that shows us that you could look into other civilizations to, you know, gain empirical knowledge and so on and so forth. I totally agree. Uh, I'm not dismissing that. But when it comes to things that are to do with, you know, ethics, yeah. To, this this was a me- medical scientific issue, but when we when we talk about things like ethics and our hierarchies and the system and the model, uh, uh, the way of being for us as individuals and our families and societies, it has to be done from the ground up. Yes, we can agree and learn from certain empirical insights of other movements, whether it's feminism or red pill, right? But it has to be grounded within the tradition. So right, sometimes right. some brothers say, you know, <clears> take the the bad well if you already know what the good is and you know what bad is then stick to that that reference absolutely which, yeah oh, does that make sense bro? that makes a lot of sense and i wanted to touch on all of that because you're you hit the nail on the head in that even things like definitions matter like words such as domestic violence violence mm-hmm. now disagreements in, include violence in the woke mobs men, uh, mentalities so they, they're playing with definitions uh high value Right, a lot of these are terms that are laden with pre, pre, uh, presuppositions that are philosophical in some way, shape, or form. And where red pill and and populist feminist, we'll, let's, we'll we'll call both of them populist at this point because there is a non-academic form of them that's been spread on the internet. Uh, obviously, feminism has been far more widespread and far more institutionally pervasive, but both of them have a populist kind of form that's been dumbed down for the masses. And what you see is in both cases, there are liberal attitudes. There mm-hmm. are patterns that facilitate each other. Being a guy who wants to be a playboy and sleep around thinking that, you know what, this whole, you know, traditional ways is a, is a, is a, is a lost cause. It's not going to come back. Uh, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to get the best deal I can by sleeping around with as many women as I can. That mindset is, is only going to facilitate more emasculation because you're not going, you're not helping men revive any kind of responsible authority by participating in the corruption of women, right? By participating in, in a culture of fahisha, of, mm. of fornication, of irresponsibility, of breaking relationships and creating baggage, right? If this happens on a mass scale, especially, that's a problem. And each guy thinks oh, it's just going to be me. But it's not going to just be you who, who has that mindset. And it doesn't matter if it's just you, because whether you know it or not, there is Allah and his messenger, وسلم, and that means there is accountability that you don't understand. So I wanted, to, I, I wanted to stress that Islam is not necessarily, not all non-Muslim models are equally distant from Islam. Christianity, we can see, is closer to Islam than uh, many Nordic forms of paganism, right? Or Hinduism, 
There's, there's, there's no denying this. Both are kufr. But we can see that there are certain truth claims in Christianity that can be more linearly corrected by Islam than, say, Hinduism or other forms of paganism that involve certain types of subversions or distortions that are far more convoluted, far more inverted. You have to, It's like upside down, inside out. Polytheism itself, right? Yes, uh, which is interesting because there is a there is a instance in prophetic history, right? And the Byzantines, right? Well, yes, the Byzantines were fighting the Persians, the Persians and the right. Sahaba wanted the Byzantines to win, and the Prophet right. made dua, right? right? Which really, you have a prophetic evidence from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with regards to what you're saying. Like, not right. all is the same from that perspective, right? In terms of you know, how far they are away from Islam. Um, so that's very interesting. So I, are you now trying to say something like, you know, is our, our red pill and feminism, you know, two sides of the same coin? Or is one coin more aligned with the Islamic perspective? I'm saying that there are aspects of red pill that are the same side of the, of the coin as feminism. For example, do as you want which is a liberal mindset, freedom. But there are other aspects of it that are far closer to the Islamic ethos when it comes to understanding the nature of gender itself or intersexual dynamics. And that's not something Red Pill even has a monopoly over because you've had sure. you know, various uh, sciences within um, psychology, in, in, in neuroscience, biology. Biology maybe, yeah. Right? In so many, so many different sciences, anthropology as well. Um, a good book, is by uh, Dr. David Gilmore it's called Manhood in the Making, where, where he analyzes these patterns cross-culturally and across time. And, and you find that there are a lot of uh, agreements between the more nuanced red pill thinkers when it comes to intersexual dynamics, like how, is, well, how does attraction work? And what others have found independently. And then what we find in our source texts by various scholars, like for example, if the, if the masses were to read Imam al-Ghazali, rahimullah's uh, Adab al-Nikah, his, his uh, book, I think it's, it's correctly translated as The Proper Conduct of Marriage. You'll find statements in that book, amongst many others, that people would be like, oh, this sounds kind of red pill. Mm. Or this sounds red pill. I think, I, I, think I read that book. I read, read that book when I, maybe the first few years when I became Muslim. And I was like, <clears> whoa. Yeah. <laughs> whoa. Right. Absolutely. So it, it goes to show that a lot of the times what people, when people have an issue with red pill, it's not the stuff that I pointed out that are problematic, such as a culture of fahisha, um, not being grounded in a consistent set of principles, being contradictory by encouraging problems that feminists themselves complain about, acting out in liberal ways. It's because of things that they would have problems with when it comes to many of our own scholars views throughout history mm. and this is something i've never heard anyone publicly state right and and you can read many 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 source texts that involve layers upon layers upon layers of the dynamics between men and women and you will find that most of the modern muslims today including numerous imams and 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 so-called ustadas and sheikhs anyone who's a celebrity speaker right they would be triggered by or they would feel ashamed of and, and be unable to publicly defend. That's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so it's a huge problem. So what's, what's more problematic for the Muslims today? Like what's more of a threat? Is it feminism or red pill? I would say undeniably it is feminism. Mm -hmm. Undeniably. I, I agree with that. I would agree right? with that. Especially what we've discussed so far. Right. Because uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, feminism is... is 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 the cause of what's destroying you know muslim family the necessary moral hierarchies red pill is a reaction to the problem right right so we need to go straight to the problem itself which is which is feminism um in all of its waves if you like um okay so i want to i want to add one more one more point to that to to hit yeah, that sure. point home you didn't have Andrew Tate being invited to the Reviving the Islamic Spirit Convention to talk about patriarchy, but you did have Linda Sarsour invited in 2016. 
And she publicly states in front of numerous students of knowledge and imams, quote, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a feminist, end quote. And statements like, quote, he would support BLM, end quote, Black Lives Matter as a movement, which was uh, founded by, by lesbians and had a, an LGBTQ agenda. So when people tell me that they're equal problems, they, they're either being dishonest or they're talking way out of their lanes because you don't I agree. have to. I mean, what that person said is just a sign of jahiliya, like total, utter ignorance. To give someone like that platform is they need to do tawbah. They need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to they need to do a lot of istighfar, a lot of asking of forgiveness. And <clears throat> like that person should never be given platform in any Muslim space ever, ever. Like ever. just by virtue of those statements. Now and they were backed, you know, that's the thing. There were mainstream speakers who have publicly endorsed this person and they never added disclaimers. And there well, are, I think you notice they've moved away now from that. There's been a. I think th she's rejected them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's happened. Yeah, but which I, I shows, mean, which shows no public that accountability, the dominant frame, because right. you know these men should be rejecting her and saying we ne should never have supported you. We should have never this supported. Why we should never have supported you? Right. We were wrong. We're doing public toba. Let's move forward in a positive way. And you know, I, and I've done my own criticism. I've made, uh, I've you know, expressed criticism about this issue. Obviously, I never mentioned names. It's not my modus operandi. It's, I don't think it's healthy. Right, right. But I've mentioned the fact that good leadership is to accept where you went wrong, to be want to be held to account, and to say yes, I was part of a problem. I facilitated the problem. I supported people that I should mm -hmm. never have ever supported, and that we should be honest with the community and say, I'm really sorry. I, I made a mistake and I didn't follow principles. I didn't, you know, enforce the masculine frame, if you like. I didn't enforce the Islamic principles in the right way. I now realize I was wrong and I've done a lot of damage. Right. Please forgive me. I'll do Tawbah to Allah. But here's my strategy now for, for the future. And, and, and I've advised people privately, by the way. And I said, if you, if you were to do this, as one person in particular, if you, if you were to do this, you gain a lot of respect, man. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. You gain a lot of respect right. because you've admitted a mistake, you've admitted a failed strategy, you've admitted, you know, something that is like, uh, frankly, spiritual, theological gross misconduct, right? And then now you're moving forward in a positive way. Now, if you don't do that, when people know what you've done, you're going to lose trust. And for me, you know, a good sign of prophetic masculinity and leadership is having that self awareness to say, you know what? I made a mistake. This is why I made the mistake. This is what I'm doing to rectify. Please forgive me. I'm going to do Toba. And this is my way forward now. Please support me. Then you build some trust again, right? Absolutely. But we have this kind of, and this is for me, not masculine, which is I'm not, not willing to admit my mistake. I'm not willing to admit that I had a <clears> failed strategy. <throat> I, I, you know, I, I totally messed up. And for me, that creates a lot of um, mistrust. I wouldn't trust people in leadership positions if they're like that. I would trust a leader if they said, look, I'm, I, 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 I failed. I messed up. This is how I messed up. This is the lessons learned. This is what I'm going to do to rectify the situation. If someone, if a leader came up to me like that and said those things, I'd be like, wow, you have self-awareness. You know your weaknesses. Uh, you, you're rectifying the problem. You have a strategy to move forward to uplift the community and to make Allah's word dominant and the highest. Bismillah right. behind you. But that's not happening. And people can see it. People can see it, right? And for me, I, I'm just baffled. I'm like, where is your sense of self-awareness? I mean, your shame. Have some shame. Like, if I knew I made mistakes, right? And hopefully I've done that. If you follow me on social media for years, I've said I was wrong on something, and then I move forward. Khalas. And this is how I'm going to learn. This is what I'm going to do. So on and so forth. We need to have that sense of transparency now, that sense of um, authenticity, because right. to pretend that you've never done any mistake, it was all ishtihadi, we had a certain context and nuance, you become extremely inconsistent because you don't apply the same principles to other people that you attack as well, right? Right, absolutely. So, anyway, sorry for that little rant. No, no, no. I, I really appreciate everything you said. And I and I read your, your tweet where you were offering criticisms, constructive criticisms for the uh, navigating differences statement. And everything you said there was beautiful. And what you said now, 
about accountability is directly connected to masculinity. Well, I, just to, I just want to clarify something. Sure. I didn't really attack the Navigating Differences document in detail. Right. I more, I really wanted to, it was more, not an attack, it was more of a constructive criticism on the kind of strategic and uh, political environment. In right, the which, context, right, the context, the context around it. Because right. it's so important. If You can't say in isolation, yeah? Absolutely, that's true. The way we've come from, what mistakes we have made, to pretend now that we were not part of the problem and now we're providing a solution when people know we were part of the problem or they were part of the problem. Right. And now you move forward this thing as if now you're solving a, a, a massive problem that you had nothing to do with, with all due respect, with <clears> all due <throat> respect, just lacks leadership. Lacks Absolutely. leadership. Absolutely. Now, I don't want to hate, you know, you know I, I believe good things are happening now. There's, Inshallah. There's the Inshallah. I don't know too much of the details. And, you know, I'm always behind people who want to do great work. And people see that on different sides of the theological and political spectrum. Right. It's good. It's in line with the dean. I'm right behind you. So the next question is, my beloved brother, and which is the most important question, I think, especially for what I want the viewers to take and to internalize, is... What is Green Pill? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I want to read a poem to answer that question that Masha my Allah. teacher, Sidi Mustafa Azam, he, he penned this, and it's a very, very brief poem, but it hits the nail on the head on what is it that I'm trying to achieve with the Green Pill? Oh man, don't aspire exclusively for Jalal, and neither aspire exclusively for Jamal, but aspire exclusively for Muhammad, and in him you will find your Kamal. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa That's a beautiful poem. That is a beautiful poem. Subhanallah. That is actually a really beautiful poem. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ustad Mustafa Azam is someone who I owe uh, more than I can I can do justice in expressing here. He he has taken me under his wing and he has been a mentor and a a, a teacher, a senior, and an older brother slash uncle figure, all in one, and of course a friend. And he actually translated. Uh, the uh, Burda of Imam Busiri, rahimullah, which is a poem uh, of great love and reverence for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it also contains a lot of Sunni creedal points and wisdoms that Sidi Mustafa has walked us through, and he's translated that into the first singable English version. And he's also the one who took me on my first ziyarat to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. He took me to my very first Umrah. And he, he, he is a model of you know, masculinity that I think your description of me earlier is more fitting for. Right? I'm, not, I'm not a what you described me as with such generosity as a, as a true specimen of, of prophetic masculinity. I, I still have a lot of work to do, and all of us do. And we will never reach it. It's a it's an it's a an approximation we can only aspire towards, and will, that will tether us. But Sidi Mustafa is someone who I've seen, you know, live and embody the the, the concepts and practices of prophetic masculinity, sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, better than anyone else that I know. Wow. And he's and he's he's helped me with my own framing for my own programs that have cemented the green pill movement. And so in this poem, you see words like Jalal and Jamal and Kamal. And they mean, Jalal means majesty. Jamal means beauty. You have majesty and beauty, my, my brand. And Kamal means perfection or completion, right? And so when you fuse majesty and beauty, you get perfected masculinity. When you fuse strength with softness, justice with mercy, firmness with leniency, 
expansion and, constr and, and constriction, limits and flexibility, then you get matured masculinity. And when that is when those limits and when those the, the the majestic and the and the and the beautiful forms are defined by the Sharia and and by the Sunnah, you get prophetic masculinity. And there's a consequence of this. It means that non-Muslims can aspire towards masculinity, right? Which I define as the form best fit, most capable of exercising authority. That's how I define masculinity. And authority itself has a beautiful side and a majestic side. Every parent knows this. Every teacher knows this, right? And men are, have been instructed and designed to be most fit to be able to tap into both sides of the spectrum right accordingly but if you're if you're not if you're not connected to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then you'll never know what the specific demarcations and li correct limits and correct values and correct movements and correct you know flexibilities are you're just going to be doing guesswork maybe some some of it will be from your fitra maybe some of it will be from your culture some of it will be from you know so called science and you're going to be, you know, swinging in the dark overall, right? And I'm not saying non-Muslims can't develop their masculinity. Of course they can. We already know this. But they'll never perfect it or, or, mm. or approximate perfection if they try to do it without direct connection to the Prophet wasallam. And any time they actually do develop it well, they are coincidentally practicing sunnas, whether the sunnah of Allah which is how the world has been designed to work, or the son of the Prophet وسلم, without even realizing the latter. Allah Akbar. Allah right? Akbar. And it's so beautiful because I think all the brothers listening to this and even the sisters, we should always ask, you know, what would the Prophet وسلم, have done in this specific situation or context that you're in? It's so important because sometimes automatically we go to our own kind of inferences our own limited experiences our own you know limited cognitive abilities we're going to this ism and that ism and that and that frame of reference and you know this source of morality and all of that stuff but we need to first ask the question especially in the context of our conversation what would have what would the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have done in this particular context that i'm in if you're willing to ask ask that question and you're open to get a correct answer, then I think you know this solves the masculinity crisis in in, in essence, right? Um, because we we don't really ask those questions about our ways of our way of being. How must we relate to ourselves? How must we relate to other people? And how must we relate to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? And this is very important because you know the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that complete perfect way. And I think that poem is just, it's ajeeb, it's amazing. It was such a beautiful, beautiful, concise, eloquent, multi-layered, deep, profound poem. I'm just so impressed, like literally. Um, may Allah bless the Sheikh. So, so, okay, so give me, give me, Give me a kind of history of, of this Green Pill movement and give me some of the things of, sure. you know, what, what you talk about when it comes to Green Pill. Obviously, you're saying let's refer back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, let's be like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's, you know, be a walking Quran because as we know, the famous hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his character was a walking Quran. So we know this, you know, sometimes these things become <laughs> theological and spiritual slogans, if you like, right? Right, so, right. I think the way to unpack this a little bit further is why did you start the Green Pill movement and what do you teach? What do you instruct? What, how do you empower? Absolutely. Beautiful questions. And these are very important questions because a lot of the statements that you've shared with me have become cliches that a lot of people who don't actually understand the specific problem men are, or, or nature of the problems men are facing tend to parrot. But if you press them on, what does it mean to be like the Prophet Sallallahu, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They only reinforce the very skepticism that has developed in a lot of young guys because they don't tell you the full truth about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They will tell you whatever is politically correct. Yes. Right? They will distort in the worst case scenarios the true nature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And young men who know better 
who can research, they're, they're very, very disenchanted when they see that. And we have to remember the larger context here. We're in a time where there have been sheikhs, so-called sheikhs, who claim to have studied with great scholars in Tarim, Yemen, who very, very, very obnoxiously, you know, preached at the at the at the uh, Democrat-aligned women's march in Washington. That we sh we 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 support all the women in 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 uh, attendance and the women in attendance who were who were wearing hats that they literally called very grossly pussy hats they 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 deliberately called them that they they were pink hats and they called them pussy hats and they were they were uh campaigning for pro lgbtq rights sex positive views on sex work all kinds of fahisha pro abortion indiscriminate abortions and this so called sheikha she is telling these women that the womb is connected to the throne of God. And so your calls for justice will be validated by God. God will hear it. He's on your side. And that's, this is what she's telling these women. And later she preaches again at an Islamic conference that she was disappointed that she didn't see more Muslim men there. And so when women who are supposed to be scholars say this, when scholars hear people who are, who are outright uh, blasphemers at, in, at, in the worst case scenario, or, or very, very corrupt, at least, talk about how the Prophet ﷺ was a feminist, and they lie about the Prophet ﷺ like that. And no scholar does anything. No, no, no organizer gives disclaimers. What ends up happening is young guys are disillusioned. They don't trust the mainstream. And I was noticing this, and I was frustrated about this myself growing up here in Canada. I saw what the dominant frame was or all around me through high school, through university, in academia. And it was very troubling to me. And when I would ask around, no one had a clear answer. They would give nice platitudes that were vague. Just follow the Quran and Sunnah. Well, you're telling the lay people not to interpret the Quran and Sunnah alone on one hand. And then on the other hand, you expect them to unpack uh, a theory of masculinity that is perfectly aligned with the Quran, Quran and Sunnah and applicable to our modern condition by themselves. The contradiction is, is it was glaring and the problem was glaringly obvious to me, especially when, I, when you consider the fact that a lot of these speakers, they, they themselves didn't actually understand how to relay the masculinity of the Prophet wasallam, and the layers and layers and layers of very gendered fiqh that we have. You know, the fiqh of marriage, the fiqh of relationships, the, the differences in fiqh that applies to men and women, the Quranic acknowledgement that men are not like women, or the male is not like the female, and the numerous ways this manifested to expect lay people to figure it out, it was absurd. And so I set out on a quest. The quest was theoretical and it was also practical because you can learn things in theory but if you've been emasculated your whole life if you've grown up if you've grown up like that simp we'll call him charlie chump like sidi mustafa azam ustad mustafa azam coined charlie chump is the simp guy and joe the jerk is the tyrannical guy if you've grown up in those broken conditions and you've grown up in a broken society where even the non-muslims who have some kind of cultural backing there, some kind of political backing there, even they feel emasculated. How are you going to feel as a, as a Muslim who's displaced from your lands, from your heritage, from your traditions? I, I expected the left to understand at least that for all their talk of deco decolonizing and all their talk of, oh, we need to stand up for minorities. In that case, all of a sudden, they didn't care. They didn't care about the struggles of young men. They thought that no, if, if the moment men wanted to develop it means they're aligning with white supremacists, even though when I, would, when I was studying to develop my system and the Green Pill movement, I was amazed to find out that people like Malcolm X, he was, he was teaching husbandry courses in the 60s. This was before he left the so-called nation of Islam. But even while he was within that, that organization upon false teachings, he understood the need for masculinity training for his community.
there were so many African American men who referred to him as as their manhood. They said Malcolm was our manhood. And if you if you read his biography, you'll you'll see statements by him talking about the need to be firm with women, but also give them affection from a place of strength, from a place of authority. He talks about these things explicitly and he's quoted and there are there are still videos of him up. So when I was looking at that, I was like, how come how come the left never talks about that that side of Malcolm? They're never they're never going to admit that side of Malcolm. And if he at that time understood that certain minority communities are broken in such a way that they need masculinity training, why are we different? Why are we in any exception when we also have many issues in our communities being being a post-colonial group like if you think about it the 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 kilafa is our manhood in a sense it's our frame and the umma is right now fatherless in a sense it's like a, it's like a single mother umma that's being violated by our stepfather oh, no. the west right and so muslim men around the world especially in the west who are completely displaced, they feel emasculated from multiple angles. For, the, for many of the reasons, even a lot of white non-Muslim guys feel emasculated, and then doubly more for their own unique reasons, right? And I felt like that growing up because I knew, you know, things are not right. Our, our, our people are terrified after 9-11, and they don't understand how to be authentic they they are they have been conditioned to hide an authentic Islam because they want to be Charlie Chump now to fit in. They want approval, right? This is the simp complex on a on a on a macro scale now, and it's breaking our communities and it's opening the doors for our women folk to to go astray to choose other authorities. And looking at this, I was very 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 frustrated. It was very painful. And different people understood this di these dynamics from different perspectives, but. You know, for example, the left, they would never acknowledge the correct order and hierarchy of, of gendered relationships in Islam. So I knew I couldn't turn to them beyond their analyses of foreign policy. You know, I couldn't turn to them for this. And the more conservative leaning Muslims, they didn't understand how to explain, you know, how prophetic masculinity applies to us today. Right. Let alone show us how to actually apply it. It's one thing to you, you. You're already way ahead of the of the of the community if you can explain it. But then the the second step is: can you train boys? Right. So the the, the amount of work that's needed is not simple, and mm. a lot of this is something that a civilization is supposed to do for you. Like amongst the Ottomans, a lot of these functions were taken care of by the Islamic society, right? Politically, economically, socially, culturally, theologically. So their frame was intact. They had their manhood. Many, many scholars have described uh, manhood as being in your intellect and in the religion, the boundaries, right? And if you think about what the deen is, it's, it's, the, the deen defines our boundaries, the limits that, we're, that are supposed to define us. And so when we had a, a polity, we had that def defining structure. So you had all kinds of facilitation for boys to become men. And obviously the nature of life that exists in those type of contexts, you're going to be trained from a young age to do things that will tap into your fitra, your design, wrestle, learn to fight, learn to communicate yourself openly and clearly, have a set of values that are upon the truth that teach you about the correct hierarchies in society. Your spiritual development, dealing your with spiritual your... spiritual development, yeah. your creed... Uh -huh. Sure. Right, and your connection to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah. So when I first uh, first visited Istanbul, and I saw the the wonders, the the maqams of so many shuyuk, so so many awliya, and and I learned about their histories. I was amazed that you know these were men who were integrated. They had a masculinity that was integrated and holistic. They weren't fractured like simps or tyrants. They were strong, virile, intelligent, fierce, courageous, well-socialized, well-mannered, respectful, dignified, just men. And I was like, subhanAllah, we don't see that very often today. 
if, if you can become that today, you're incredible. May Allah preserve you. I mean, and I noticed that the problem was different in different communities. Like I mentioned earlier, some places you had more of the conservative dysfunctions. In Canada, we had the, the liberal kinds, the liberal dysfunctions. There were, those are more present. In America, same deal. And then I thought about how the Prophet وسلم, uh, in the Shamayil Muhammadiyah, this one is, this is a great one actually, it's right here. This one was translated uh, by Sheikh Muhammad Aslam and Sheikh Abdul Aziz Suraka. And they did a great job. And one of the descriptions of the Prophet وسلم, that I came across was that he was broad shouldered and that in, in the time of pre-Islamic Arabia, being broad-shouldered carried many significant connotations amongst the, uh, amongst the uh, Bedouins. You know, it meant you were dignified. It meant, it meant you were virile and strong, but that you were also steadfast and generous. So when I read this, I, I thought, there's something going on here, that there's a balance between majesty and beauty in all these men who follow the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I wanted to develop a system that could facilitate that development in boys today and young men today. And obviously, first and foremost, in myself, right? And wherever you are as a man on the, on the spectrum of your development will vary based on obviously how you've been raised, your parents, your father, right? Whether your father made you feel like a champ who earned his way, right? high self-esteem, but responsibility. Or even for girls, whether you felt you, you were made to feel cherished, discipline and boundaries, but deep love. And a lot of people didn't get that, partly from the excesses of the boomer generations that came here. And I sympathized, I sympathized with a lot of the girls and young women who were being pushed into like seriously you know, dysfunctional paths, careerism. A lot of their parents were obsessed with status, even for their daughters. So you ought to be a doctor just to get married as a woman. And they're throwing their daughters into these terrible environments without understanding, right? And I didn't understand how to navigate that to deliver my programs, but I had to learn to empathize even with the parents and some of their baggage, some of their struggles, their displacement, the way they had to, to earn their way in a foreign land. So it was a very complicated process of coming to terms with these different dynamics. But growing up here, I got to see firsthand a lot of different cultures, a lot of different communities. And I realized that regardless of their differences, regardless of the different you know, general parenting styles you can see in each and the different types of you know, positives and negatives that leads to in people, in men and women, there was a need for a, a very specific program that demarcates what is prophetic masculinity and how you can apply it today. And that meant I needed to look into working with scholars who could actually show me and teach me a fuller picture of the Prophet وسلم, and not a PC one, not one that, that is censored. And then I needed help extracting wisdoms from our source texts and different examples of scholars who lived those texts and then number three fusing those with modern wisdoms and, mo and, and, and understanding how to apply them to modern problems for example how do you deal with the male anxiety that is cross-cultural you look at guys in Japan they have a phenomenon of being isolated into their rooms I think it's called hik hikikimori in South Korea, in, in the Indian subcontinent. A lot of young guys feel emasculated for various reasons. In North America, you have entire you know, populations of young guys who are, who are addicted to porn. They find escape through video games where they can feel like they can level up without risk. <clears throat> so it's all, it's all risk-free. Dopamine hits. And, and the feeling of, of self-mastery and the mastery of your terrain without actually getting bruised. And so noticing all this, I decided the first thing I need to do is form an inner circle of brothers who understand the problem, 
connect with scholars who are already green pilled, meaning they are already able to see through the distortions that have become mainstream. For example, distortions of fiqh, distortions of the sirah, distortions of gender roles, and so on and so forth. And then working with them, plus fusing my own background in psychology and uh, social work, putting together a program that would address the physical, psychosocial, and spiritual needs of boys and men. And so I realized that in boyhood, what many boys are being deprived of now is grounding through a paternal figure that can teach them discipline through pain and pleasure and through pushing them through physical exertion, whether it's through sports, you know, labor, teaching them to work with their hands through crafts, right? Like a lot of guys used to get apprenticeship in the past. They had, they had um, rites of passage and many guys have lost that today. They are burdened with certain expectations. You have, to, you have to excel in school. But there's no clear point where they're treated like men. right? In fact, they're, they're, they're viewed as children all their lives. and Or, you know, the oldest child in the family. Which is how a lot of women have come to view men. So I realized part of the work had to be physical as well. Because men and women are different in various ways. Testosterone being a key one. And the physical dimension of, of manhood, I, I noticed, you know, through my own experiences doing boxing, which I know you love, wrestling in high school, uh, lifting, powerlifting, that it deals with a lot of the problems guys are facing, which has produced neurosis, where they're stuck in their heads and disconnected from real world feedback. If you look at the online world, that's what, it, what a lot of their problems are. They're, they're neurotic. They're living in a fantasy world. They don't have real, real world feedback. There's a reason you said, I, I'll, I'll pay a thousand pounds to whoever says so-and-so to my face. And if someone could say something to your face, even if you held them accountable, at some level you would know that, hey, at least this person is congruent. There's something about him I can trust more because I can predict him. I know he's a man of his word, even if I don't agree with him. Right? And I noticed that being involved in the physical world is the easiest way to develop that as a man. Because the laws of, of nature, if you will, they don't lie to you. They, t they train you and they teach you how things work very rawly, very linearly. And you have no choice but to adapt and understand the correct limits that you need to work within. And that teaches you responsibility. And that teaches you respect for limits. And if you don't, there are immediate consequences. A broken jaw, car accidents, falling from great heights, burning your hands, right? So I knew that guys need to learn all this through some form of physical discipline. The one I personally really like to offer, MMA. But any kind of physical activity is, is okay, including trekking, doing group activities through uh, camping, hiking, and immersing yourself in, a, in, a, in an environment where you're also getting things that many young men are suffering from the deprivation of, like sunlight. Instead of getting natural vitamin D and the, and the red light that is good for your testosterone and is natural sunscreen for, for the UV rays in the, in, the, in the afternoon, which is also good for testosterone, what they're getting is blue light from the screens all day, which are, which are destroying them hormonally, right? And so to combat... All of these problems, I decided that I was going to put together two key programs. One of them is called Becoming Men, Rojula Foundations. And the other one is called Life Vetting Mastery. And these would help guys with their main uh, issues. Number one, not understanding manhood. Number two, not being able to apply it in finding a wife, let alone keeping one. And in each of these programs... I'm very careful to define the foundational differences between Islam and, say, Red Pill. For example, we don't just accept material assumptions. We don't just look at, you know, the body. We look at the fact that there's also a soul, that there's a fitrah, and that's going to affect how we view human nature. If you just, if you just look at us as, bi as biological machines that have no fitrah, you're not going to understand what, the hum what a human being is fully, and you're not going to understand male nature or female nature fully. You only have maybe a part of the picture. And so I try to look at all the source texts that, dis that distinguish the
the male fitra and male roles from the female fitra and female roles. For example, if we look at one, this is a really beautiful hadith. And I heard a great friend, he's, he's actually a Muay Thai coach and an ex-pro fighter. He is also very spiritual, which I really value about him. And he called this the alchemy of womanhood. And it's a hadith where Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, which type of woman is best? And she said, the woman who does not speak evil is not tricked by the machinations of men and whose heart is free of all but pleasing her husband and taking care of her family. How would the feminists react to this? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is a beautiful hadith. Beautiful. Beautiful. Because that's what every man wants as well, right? Right. right. And Absolutely. it's a sahih hadith. And nurturing and loving, obedient wife. Right. Right. Whose focus is the, uh, the, the primary focus of, you know, their major role and responsibility in society. Right. Absolutely. 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 And there are just so many other hadith, including those that deal with how the Prophet وسلم, provided tarbiyah to his own wives, our mothers, radiallahu anhuna, where he kept almost a month of distance. And if yes, people yes, were to yes. read that, those, the, the narrations around those, I mean, they would be triggered. That's the honest truth. Unless they have been accustomed and connected to the tradition early on, and he the, would create and the, the pillars were called that he kept masculine frame. <clears throat> right. <laughs> Subhanallah. Yeah. So when I would look at these, I would try to craft the, the founding principles of the Green Pill movement. And I built a hierarchy where you have principles, you have forms, and then you have techniques. Right. And the principles are where we start because what I, th I find the red pill community lacking is it doesn't have a, a, top-down approach it has a bottom-up approach often and it's not very precise it confuses uh, incidental things with universal things like for example oh yeah this guy you know he's he's uh, rude and belligerent and he wears leather jackets and he's very he, he calls himself alpha and he gets all the women and the the simp guy doesn't so i have to be like that to get attraction working with my wife but that's anyone with any understanding of logic would realize that's very fallacious what how do you know what was working to create attraction there you just assumed it was this and that and you're not, you're not precise yeah and so yeah, i'm making right. sure right that you're we're principled you're deriving yeah. these principles from the source text themselves as when you're applying it in a contemporary right. way right which is exactly what's needed we need the green pill movement we need a movement where someone is teaching our young men the principles from the quran and the sunnah from the the principles of prophetic masculinity to apply in the physical life, in the spiritual life, in the social life, right. and in the family life. And this is exactly what we need. Absolutely. And if you don't have this, you get very messy analyses and people get confused. They think, oh, hypergamy. So explain why Will Smith and Johnny Depp ended up the way they did. They had a lot of hypergamy, hypergamous factors going for them. But both of them had disastrous romantic lives. And, and they lost frame, if you will. They did not exercise authority. And so we look at these dynamics and we explain what is it that is fundamental to masculinity and attraction, authority. How do you define that? And we, we, we I demarcate two types of authority. One is positional. One is dispositional. Positional is like status-based. You're a police officer. You have the uniform. This positional is you can actually do your job and exercise authority well to create order and harmony. Even if it means butting heads a little bit, there, has, there might be some friction. But like any coach, you know how to steer your dependence in the right direction. And you're not afraid. You're not, you're not fake. You can be really and truly intimate. You don't run from conflict. You don't fake niceness, niceness in it. You care about the true long-term good of all involved. So sometimes you might have to get aggressive to some degree, but it's coming from a place of love, right? Tough love. And if you don't have that, you can have the uniform, you can have the badge, you can be officially the husband, officially the teacher, officially any position of authority. 
but you won't be respected. And when people find out that you, you don't have congruence with your role, they're not going to feel satisfied with you, right? They'll, they'll understand that you're not actually able to create order in their lives, which is why a lot of these celebrities failed. They had status, they had money, they could attract a lot of regular women, but the women that they chose, they couldn't govern them in a responsible way. The very fact that they allowed them to be involved in such a dysfunctional environment like Hollywood, where there's fahasha everywhere, that already means that they don't understand how to lead. And so when red pillars don't look at these finer nuances, they're not going to actually lead healthy relationships long term. Right. And, and this is something that we teach in our courses. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, but what I was thinking in my head right now when right. I was listening, or what came up, give us maybe a couple of examples of, of what you teach and maybe specific scenarios. That'll be that be quite powerful. Sure, sure. Uh, from the prophetic sunnah, from the principles <clears throat> that you've developed from Islam in, in certain contexts. Obviously, I'm not asking you to give you the whole for you to right. give me the whole green pill movement teaching, but give me some examples so people could practically see that um, these are workable, profound, timeless principles that have come from essentially Brilliant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brilliant. I have numerous case studies from my clients where, you know, they came to me thinking that they have to be monotone and suppress what they want from their wives, and that's going to help the relationships. And far from it, one of their wives was telling them, you know, I want you to be more like my, my brother or my brothers. And he's like, what do you mean? She's like, be more, show more caveman masculinity. And he's like, I don't understand. And she herself was very imprecise. What does she mean by caveman masculinity? But it was obvious to me what she was getting at was she wants him to be more candid, more raw, less filtered, less fake, less masked. She wants to feel authenticity and strength from him, right? And she wants to know that he is trustworthy. If you speak to a guy on the street and you say, hey, how do I get to the masjid? And he's like, uh... You go this way, and then you take a right. And then the second guy says, no, you go down about 500 meters, and then you take a right turn on Waterloo Street. Who are you going to trust more? You're going to obviously trust the second guy, right? There's a chance he might be wrong, even though he sounds more confident. But if all you have to go by are their body language and tone, you're going to trust the one who seems committed to his own frame. Because you won't trust the one who's uncertain. And women understand this about men. And it, whether they can specify it is irrelevant to the fact that they can feel it, right? They'll, they'll feel safer and more secure with the man who is grounded, who is confident. So I told my client, listen, what's, what's the main problem in your relationship? He's like, well, she's, she's in school. So I'm doing all the cooking and I'm paying for everything. I'm working full time. I'm, I'm cooking and I'm, I'm just trying to make life easy for her. And I said to him, do you think that that's made her more invested in your marriage or less invested? He's like, what do you mean? And it, it, it went to show he didn't even understand what, what it meant to be invested. His, his entire understanding of the, of the dynamics of attraction were completely absent because he was following the blueprint of Disney and Hollywood and all the celebrity speakers that told him that if he just vacuums more, his wife will be more happy with him and, and she'll be intimate. And I said to him, listen, you need to understand context. You can, there's a context to making life easier for your wife, but you're not understanding that context and you're just sloppily applying bad advice. And you need to understand that your wife is not invested in you because you constantly defer to her. You free her of any and all responsibilities to you and you are permissive about everything. So she doesn't even think you have your own investments. Why would she be invested in you if you don't have your own investments? You're her shadow. And she doesn't want to be married to a shadow. Her nafs might enjoy it, but her fitra is craving. It's craving structure, direction, authenticity, presence, intimacy. Even if it's not beautiful always, right? You'll find that this is ref reflected in women who sometimes push their husbands just to get a reaction out of them when, they're, when they've been robots. They want to feel something. And guys who are good with women understand this about women, that they want to feel something. And you could do this from a place of authority and a place that directs their feelings towards balanced, harmonious fulfillment. 
And I was teaching him that to do that, you need to stop doing everything for her. You need to communicate your boundaries to her. She is more invested in her school and then soon to be career than she is in you. And she doesn't herself understand what it means to be a wife because you haven't made her feel like a wife. Right? So I'm not, I'm not even blaming her entirely, even though her behavior is not right. But it starts, it starts with him as the leader. He has to at least try. So I told him to talk to her about his vision for how their marriage is supposed to look because he hadn't done any of that. He didn't talk about distribution of labor, gender roles, none of that. There was no talking about these things at all. And you'd be surprised how many millennial and Gen Z brothers and sisters are in this type of condition. It's not like it was in the Gen X and boomer days at all. And so a lot of older people don't understand how drastically things have changed. Some, some like aunties, they might be projecting their bad experiences from you know maybe some of the en enclaves of London in, in hyper conservative cultures, they're not understanding what's going on in this in the extreme liberal mindsets of these youngsters. And so I get to see that these guys don't know how to talk to their wives. They don't know how to even ex express their expectations and I have to teach them what to say, how to say it, what kind of body language they should be using exercises that they can do to deal with the anxiety that they feel because they feel anxiety. Like, I, I don't know if I, I'm not allowed to say that, man. If I say that uh, I'm scared. It's going to make her upset. It's going to, uh, I'm, I'm scared she's going to leave me. 99% of the time when they actually apply the principles I'm teaching them, they say, even though there was some initial friction, I could, I could tell my wife was way more attracted to me. And she was actually invested in me. And we had deeper understanding afterwards. And I'm like, well, of course you had deeper understanding because you didn't even facilitate understanding before. Mm. Right? That's just one case. And other cases would be things like clients who they, they didn't know how to stand up for themselves, even to their parents. Their parents would you know, dictate who they're, who, who they're going to marry and how without doing any you know, proper vetting. One of my clients, worst case, it's the worst case I've, I've heard. He married a politician's daughter in, in Bangladesh. And she, they come from a, a family that has a lot of trouble. And they're part of a very bad political party. So he knew deep down in his stomach that was the wrong thing to do. But guess who pushed him to do it? His mother. Not, not even his father. His father was also against it. His mother pushed him to do it. And so when we talk about, I, I understand when people refer to mommy's boys in a derogatory way, there is, there is a, there's an unfair, you know, application of that where you're, you're being good to your mother. And then there's a, an, a fair application, like in the case of this client who didn't have the frame, the wisdom, the dignity to explain to his mother firmly, but with goodness that I'm not going to do this. This is a very bad idea. And he couldn't do that. And he married her. And when he brought her over to Toronto, she was a complete mess. Every little thing. He didn't like her talking on the phone late at night while he's trying to sleep. Well, you can't tell me what to do. I'll call the police. Well, can you make me a cup of tea? No, get your own tea. Okay. I brought, I brought you food earlier. I bought food for us. Can you, would you be, would you be kind enough to at least wash the dishes? No, that's not my responsibility. Any, any money you give to me is from your parents. So I don't care about you. And, and I, I, I heard, I heard the clips. I have the screenshots, you know, and, you know, but, there must have something must have happened for it to end up like that because Absolutely. like for me it's about knowing who you are what your red yeah. lines are what the principles are and just having a and having that masculine frame like i would not even dream it wouldn't even be a hypothetical scenario in an alternate universe for anyone in my family to speak to me like that right right Right. What, like this, it's like, and I think it comes from because there's a sense of neediness with some of these brothers. Maybe they feel that they that they're scared to lose something. But with all due respect, the worst thing that you can lose you, is your sense of self. Right. The right. worst thing that you can lose is your own, you know, masculinity. The worst thing that you can lose is is you know your sense of dignity. You know, if that were to happen, you need to show that you're not scared of walking out of the room and not coming back. Right? You, Absolutely. You know, I, 
thing. You have to call that high all the time. Of course not. But, you know, in the grand cosmic scheme of things, if this would be a repetitive action and they think they can weaponize, you know, your neediness, your, your need for love and affection and connection, well, with all due respect, you could get that somewhere else. Say bye-bye. Like, yeah, bye -bye. I think there's a sense of needing going on. I mean, yeah. I don't know what, what's happening here. And for me, I'm trying to unpack and unravel the psycho-spiritual dynamic because maybe, you know, it's, it's a form of female worship, man. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Right. You should worship yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and, and worshiping Allah means to love him, <clears throat> to know him, to obey him, to be humbled before him, to direct your acts of worship to him alone. So you should be thinking, what does Allah want from me in this situation, right? Right, right. He doesn't want you to be spoken to like that. And then he wants you to be yeah. self-aware to find out how you got to that level and to rectify and have that masculine frame. Absolutely. And to understand how the Prophet ﷺ, you know, would have advised him to deal with that situation. And a lot of it is lack of deen, lack of role models. Maybe he saw his own father doing the same thing as well, bro. Um, you know, and so, yeah, it's like an ongoing cycle. And I'm thinking to myself, why would you, how can you even let it? I mean, wh what's gone wrong? I mean, I know yeah. we've already discussed that, but I'm just talking a bit more aloud now. It's past, it's like nearly one in the morning for me here. And I'm just thinking, poor guy. I mean, how, yeah, yeah. how, why? I mean, when? <laughs> I mean, I can't even put words together. Bless. It's like these poor guys. And that's why. What you're doing is so important. It is so important because a lot of us, we get stuck in the online manosphere. We think everyone's like a masculine male. Everyone knows what to say and do. But it's not the case at all. There are thousands of brothers who lack that spiritual like that. Yeah. guidance. I, as I mentioned, I wouldn't give the same medicine to a guy who I see is already asserting himself, but he doesn't have the right hikmah. He doesn't have the wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. These guys don't have that to begin with, and they're constantly ignored. You know, the male suicide rate is exponentially higher than the female suicide rate in North America and probably globally. And our imams are not acknowledging this. If they do, it's always through a very feminist lens. Like, you know what, don't suppress your emotions and you know, be more vulnerable. But they don't teach men that, you you know, part of being open and clear is that you can say things that the feminists don't like if it's true. Right. That's true. That's true. Authenticity. You're telling guys to be vulnerable, but then it's on, on the terms and conditions of who the woke mob. That's not vulnerability. That's just another mask. Right. And a lot of guys, they need to learn and be told that just being vulnerable without structure is not going to help you. It's going to get you killed in the worst case scenario yes. or at least pitied and left to the side. You, you're not supposed to be vulnerable for everyone. Not, you're not supposed to be vulnerable in front of a shaitan. They're not going to help you. They want they want to see you weak so they can harm you. There are places that call for vulnerability, and there are places and contexts that don't. If you're dealing with the nafs, right? If you're dealing with the nafs of your of a woman who's not who, who doesn't have the tarbiyah and maturity to handle your vulnerability, don't give it to her. It will be weaponized against you. Weaponized, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. It takes you know you have to be. It will be a righteous person in this context, a righteous woman, to be able to accept you know valid expressions of vulnerability and never Absolutely. to use it against um the, her husband because she loves him she adores him she wants to obey him she wants to be submissive to him devoutly obedient to him for the sake of allah oh, and allah. she sees that vulnerability as actually a strength because you shouldn't express all your vulnerabilities right right you know obviously you should have a you know a, a good connection deep connection with your wife with your spouse, a loving connection, as Allah talks about rahmah and mawadda, you know, mercy and, and love. And those vulnerabilities should be expressed in the context of strength. You know, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way he related to Khadija radiallahu anha, you know, when he came down to the mount from the mountain and saying, Cover me, cover me. And there was a there was, if you want to see it that way, there was an expression of some form of Vulnerability, if you want to frame it that way, yeah, yeah. And look, look at the piety of Khadija radiallahu anha. Look at her, the way she related to him, <clears throat> and you know, and that was that's very, very special. And um, the Prophet sallam, the way he described the love of Khadija radiallahu anha in authentic hadith, I believe it's in Bukhari. Wow. 
her love nourished me is such a powerful way of describing love huh? it's be extremely beautiful extremely beautiful so her love nourished me and you know the whole we spoke about this a bit earlier but we didn't get into it the whole thing about Khadija radiallahu anha when many feminist sisters they they see her as the boss woman the funny thing is when she married the sallallahu alayhi wa she took a step back there was a sense of hiddenness right absolutely um, and you know they 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 distort the image of Khadija radiallahu anha from that point. Say, oh, she she asked for his hand directly, which is actually not even true, right? True. But all of these things are just a distortion because they're based on a feminist uh, ideological framing, which is false, right. accurate. Right. And but anyway, it's, a grave, so, it's a grave sin to attribute fabrications to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to yeah. others. So, in terms of um, give me more, give me more. I'm really sure. Fascinated. sure. Now, literally, yeah, yeah. it's as if we're not even recording, yeah? I'm just listening. Yeah? It, it feels like that. You know, I, I forgot we were as well. I was yeah, like, we're just, yeah. we're just brothers. So, so, so I, I just want to mm -hmm. be clear about what you actually deliver. So you have, yeah. number one, the kind of social, ethical aspects, which is from the prophetic sunnah of the Prophet Salam, so which you deliver like, as yeah. principles, right. which is about becoming uh, masculine. It's about urujula, it's about masculinity, and also about picking a spouse and engaging with your spouse and having a flourishing relationship. Relationship, right. With, with and also uh, your brotherhoods, right? You know, you yeah. men men can have hierarchical, hi hierarchical relationships with their teachers. They can have peer-to-peer -peer relationships with their brothers. And then they have subordinate relationships with their mentees or younger brothers. And so both, all three of these are very important because to know how to, to lead, you also need to have tasted following someone else. Absolutely. 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 Right. I, I, to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. I really you believe that. Follower, right. Many, many so you need to have seniors to keep you in check, to guide you. Your ego must be tethered. And obviously, good. yeah. yeah. So that's another aspect. Yeah. So there's the brotherhood and the hierarchies. Right. In that as well, right. and then after you have the physical aspect, right? The physical aspect, the, the physical training, and so on and so forth. Right, so right. Would those be the three areas of of the Green Pill movement? Yes, the physical. Uh, you have the relationship to to the brothers and to to the the women folk, which can be romantic. It can be your daughters, your sisters, your mothers. Yep. Right. We we have we have brothers amongst us who have households where where their father passed away, or one of one of my great friends who you met you know just recently he, he comes from a single mother home had an abusive father and i i'm so impressed that he became green pilled instead of becoming a, a male ally he did the hard work of understanding that despite having had an abusive father the way for him to show up for for allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to oh, serve Lord. his mother and his sister and his brother is not by becoming this, you know, emasculated simp archetype. It's to actually become a man, a rajul, mm -hmm. and to understand how to exercise authority justly, aligned with the principles of Islam. How can how can he do that? Right. So he understood how to do this, and it led him to coincide with values that I myself. Uh, promote through the green pill and then we have brothers who want to get married and they haven't yet done it but they're in the process of it we have brothers who are already married but they're struggling we have brothers who have good marriages but they have children and they want to ensure their children are raised correctly and that means with the correct gendered dynamics boys and girls you know how should they as fathers relate to their boys and how, to, how should they relate to their girls right so we have all of these types of of brothers in our community of green pilled brothers and my program because it starts with principles and then goes to particulars like techniques it offers something for each of them depending on their context the principles are the same for all of them regardless so where, of their context. where do we go if we want to join the green pill movement i have a free facebook page right now called the green pill i have two telegram channels that are also free and i have my uh, my instagram page uh, majesty and beauty anyone who reaches out to me on ig or looks up my page on facebook will be able to find the green pill uh and or my page on ig they can reach out to me on ig as well and ask to be added to the, the coaching, uh, if they want coaching for me 
if they want coaching for me, the best thing for them to them to do is to reach out to me through IG. So you don't have a website, it's all social media based, yeah? I do have a website, it's still in development. Ah. So once so that's fully done, do I you will have a URL? Is that gonna do Yeah, I do have I do have a URL and I will drop the link for you. Uh, right okay, now good. it's www.becomingrijal. That's with two A's dot com. Rijal with two A's dot com. Okay, good. So and you're yes. gonna have your, your programs there and you're going yeah. to have your coaching, um, they'll be able to access your coaching from there, right? Right, right. perfect. Um, we also have like a space for financial success too, you know, building wealth, yes, building your body, building your mind, building your relationships, all goes hand, to, hand in hand, right? And my teacher, Ustad Mustafa Azam, he has his own program and community, but it's, it's very much aligned with what I do, it's just a different brand and he has a different uh model. His is called Rising Men. And mm. he has some really, really cool stuff. Uh, he calls them the M's of manhood. Let me actually read them out to you. I think they will be a great compliment. They're called the 10 M's of Muslim masculinity. M1, messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. M2, oh. mindset. M3, mission. M4, money. M5, magnetism. M6, muscle. M7, manularity. M8, mastery, M9, movement, and finally M10, melting. So it has both of the beautiful and majestic kind of dynamics involved in it, whereas mine's is more principle-oriented from like a first principles point of view. I start mm -hmm. with three core principles, balance, order, limitation. Those are the three principles. You can find these principles in many uh, aspects of Islam. Right, even even in some of the names of Allah, especially balance and order, right, and so from these three principles we derive things like authority, pain and pleasure, you know, functional and dysfunctional expectations. There is a duality in each of those, right? Just like in Majesty and Beauty, strength and softness, you have functional, dysfunctional, um, pain and pleasure. And these are all principles that we learn how to use to shape relationships, no matter what the type of relationship is. D depending on the kind of relationship, you're going to obviously take a different uh, approach in terms of application, but you're going to still use the same principles. You're going to still try to create harmony. You're going to still try to create balance. Okay, so, so let, me, let me put you on the spot here because yeah. we're approaching the three-hour mark. Sure. So. I'm gonna let so let me think of a scenario uh, which I think I haven't experienced personally, but I know brothers probably have experienced this. So they have a nice relationship with the with their wives. It's you know, there's a form of hierarchy, right? It is you know, a sense of you know piety to a certain degree. She fulfills the responsibilities, so does he. They love each other. There's this forbearance, but there's also the red lines and so on and so forth. But she gossips, <clears throat> okay. gossips in front of him, and he doesn't say anything. He just accepts it, right? What, is, what does he do? How does he put a stop to it? Step number one, principle of limitation has to be applied here. And the limitation has to be applied verbally. With the right body language, he needs to show her through his tone. Can't be monotone. He's got to be candid. And his body language can't be hunched over and looking away avoidantly. He's got to be clear and direct, as an authority should be, that he disapproves of her behavior. And he can do that in many ways. If it's an ongoing problem and he's never tried to teach her correctively before, let's begin with some gentleness. Listen, I should have addressed this a long time ago, and I allowed it to fly one too many times. But you need to stop backbiting. This is inappropriate. This is haram. I don't want to hear this type of language again. Do you, I, I need you to understand that when you're doing these acts, you're violating the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's not good for you. And it's not good for me. Tell her straight. Right? And you've given her a restriction. What not to do. Don't gossip. And tell her what to do. If you have a problem with people that you're backbiting... Let's, let's problem solve, okay? 
is there a, is there a legitimate problem there? Let's problem solve. If there isn't, stop stop yapping. But regardless, I'm going to give you what not to do, and I'm going to give you what to do, and then I'm going to say how instruction. If you give people, if you give your dependents anyone those three things, it reduces the the room for excuses. Oh, I didn't know what you expected. I didn't understand. It was unreasonable. It was it was unattainable. It wasn't clear. Nope. You you've been given a clear path to correction. And, and a responsible functional authority has to do that, right? Okay. So she responds by saying, "Well, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Uh, why are you telling me what to do? Why are you judging me for?" <laughs> Don't deflect. What did I just say? Let's bring it back. What did I just say? You said right. that backbiting is haram. Yeah. By the Quran yeah. And yeah. What does that have to do with anything that you said right now? Are we supposed to validate our, our sins? No. Don't do that. Choose mercy. Choose forgiveness. Don't deflect. All right? <laughs> so <laughs> you bring it back. <laughs> that, was really you, you, that was really good. For some yeah. for some reason, I just put myself in that scenario. I was like, <laughs> he's, he's, putting, he's putting me back. I, I, I know people like, think like, oh, is it really going to work? But my clients have done this. Uh, no, it I does mean, work. And, it, yeah. and what I've realized is if you also do it, because look, a lot of these things, because if you look at the context of, of marriage, as Allah says, right. it's muadda and rahma. It's love and mercy. Love and mercy. And, and if you really define love, love is intentional and directional. Right. You intend goodness and guidance for the person that you love. You have an affinity for them. You want genuine goodness and guidance for them. You don't have any negative uh, hidden intentions for them. You want goodness and guidance and well-being for them. And you want to be a, a part of that well-being. You you want to you know make right. sure that they have that well-being from a physical, right. spiritual, and social perspective. So if you're sincere, you have that sincere love for them it's intentional and directional you're committed to the well-being the way you express yourself even if it's assertive right. they're going to understand that it comes from a place of i'm an authority over you i love you i want your well-being i'm not necessarily saying that i'm more moral than you because everyone sins but this is my role and i've realized that there is an issue here and because i love you and i want you to go to jannah and, and I don't want us to lose baraka blessings right, from our right. family. We need to, you need to be on point here. So if it comes across that way, like you did from a perspective of muadda and rahma, even if it's assertive, yeah, it, it will come across in a particular way. Absolutely. Because sometimes yeah. we may give the advice from a place of the, the, the tyrant. Yeah. And although you are justified in giving that advice, but because it comes from a tyrannical perspective that you're there just to dominate for the sake of dominance, yeah, and to be, you know, not following the prophetic way of communicating with people to uplift them, get the best out of them, um, you know, it might not come, it might create more friction. So there is right. a way of delivering. It doesn't mean you got to be all soft and loving. Oh, yeah, don't worry, yeah. understand why you've done that. No, you don't give excuses for right. transgressions. Right, but it comes from that place. I think it it you you it really really helps, and it's really Absolutely. really. Helpful. There's a an American psychologist, Jonathan Hyde or Hayde, I think he wrote the coddling of the American mind, and he talks about how detrimental it has been to coddle the uh, millennial and Gen Z demographics. Like not not teaching them discipline in a in a direct way has actually harmed them. They're much more fragile. They lack resilience. Their mental health issues have skyrocketed as a result. They need exposure therapy in some in gradual doses. And what I mean by exposure therapy is to some real talk. You know, they need they need a little bit more real talk in their lives. And people will appreciate your real talk, your discipline, your disciplinary approach, especially women, if you've established credibility, if you're a source of pleasure. Right. If your authority is pleasurable to them, your, their needs are being taken care of. Your expectations are functional. They're aligned with their best fit three interests. They're aligned with their true design. Even if it, they, those expectations fly flat in the face of their nafsi programming, at a deeper level, there's going to be an affinity to listen to you. Right. And and this is also why part of my programming and training is to teach the brothers to positively reinforce submission. And cooperation because if you have a guy who's forceful 
in punishing violations like through his his tone is really negative he's not monotone when he's disapproving but when people his wife is good and listening and in, 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 at his service me, cooking for him listening to him apologizing he's like neg uh, uh, ne uh, neglectful or he's very monotone then what's coming through to her what message that only mm -hmm. my violations matter but when i'm good you don't care and so positive reinforcement is very much a part of authority and mm -hmm. parents know this already somehow husbands don't you know and somehow women forget it when it comes to understanding uh that authority for their husband is not intrinsically oppressive right islam has made it clear this is why we have a jamali and jalali side the mm -hmm. jamali side and jalali side come together so you have pain and pleasure right that's what moves life we all need it we all know we need it in the right doses at the right times and you know explaining your your reasoning uh showing that you're coming from a good place these are good ways to soften people but i advise brothers to do that if they see that their women folk or anyone for that matter are coming from a good faith place because you know how we can we can always point to children as an example because they're they're great examples of honesty and uh, a fitra that's pure but also a nafs that needs to be tamed if you try to explain to your your child to go to sleep at a certain time and they keep asking why you can tell they're not they don't really care about the reason right and by giving them the reason prematurely before they're in a state of rest a balance submission they're not going to respect you they're going to think i can play with him i can waste his time and he's going to be explaining himself all day right and a lot of guys they misunderstand that so there's a correct order to tarbiya right and if you look this is amazing but if you look at the commentaries of the um, classical scholars uh, the various tafsir of surah 4 verse 34 you find some incredible incredible insight men are in charge bismillah men are in charge over women because allah has made one of them excel over another and because men have expended their wealth over them so the virtuous women are submissive they keep watch in the absence of their husbands as Allah commanded to watch. <clears throat> and as to those women who diso whose disobedience you fear, then admonish them and sleep apart from them. And then obviously it says, and beat them lightly. Then if they come under your command, then seek not any way of excess against them. Undoubtedly, Allah is exalted great. Now obviously, Few people in the Western speaker circuit cite the full verse, right? And I actually had a run-in with a with a an Azari uh, Sheikh who was very popular, and he, you know, he gave a very, 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 just completely distorted commentary of this verse. And he, he cited like the first line, and he was he was basically saying that what this verse is saying is that men have to serve their families like a plumber. And they have to be a 10 at home. And there was not one mention of authority. And I was like, well, you can serve from authority and you can serve without authority. So which one is it? You can't just say serve because the wife is serving too. Is her, is her servicing the same as yours? And mm -hmm. he obviously didn't take well to those types of questions. And I looked at the traditional commentaries. And for example, Imam Tabari, Rahimullah, he says, the men deserve to be in charge of their women in disciplining them and assisting them in their obligations towards Allah as well as towards the men themselves. And I was like, why does it mention and towards the men themselves? It's almost as if if you're passive about instructing your women folk on how to treat you, then you can expect not to be treated the way you want. Mm. And it's not necessarily even their fault or, or a coming from a place of malice. It could also simply be they don't know what you want because you haven't been clear. You haven't guided them. So you can't blame them for that if you yourself have been passive. You, you can't expect them to mind read you and put that burden on them. In fact, you should be the one to do more of that than them. And I notice that guys who, who don't actually take responsibility of both heading their relationships and teaching in those relationships they actually end up making their wives feel very anxious so it's hard for them to you know correct their wives because their wives don't actually trust them 
because they haven't been the predictable, secure uh, disciplinaries, right? Mm. Uh, this is where, where Red Pill is very flat out wrong often because it says you have to be very, very, very purposely unpredictable. It tells men to play mind tricks on their on their wives because they think that's exciting. They they miss they can, and this is what I meant by they conflate what's incidental with what's with, with what is essential because it's not the excitement factor from being some unhinged drama freak that's really working here. What it is is the fact that you are asserting yourself in a candid way that appears spontaneous because you're not scripted. But what you're doing is you're still following a template of tarbiya. You're just not suppressed. It's like when you, when you talk to a person who can speak off the cuff, he can engage you, but he's still following principles versus someone who's monotone and just like very boring. And the red pill community will teach guys that, Hey, if you want to, if you want to, you know, get your women to really be attached to you, you got to, you got to create some dread game. That's what they call it, right? And yes, there's room for being exciting, teasing, right? Because that, that creates connection and intimacy and it creates investment. But the way a lot of guys have internalized this is we're going to be completely unpredictable and do things that are actually dysfunctional, that are not at all, at all part of being a responsible leader. Mm. And that's going to be attractive, and that is inauthentic and almost meaningless yeah. because you just have a fake relationship if you if you play games like that, right? Right. It's like, oh, I'm today. I'm not going to call her. I'm only going. I'm only going to call her one time and wait like three hours. It's like if you're busy because you're an actual man who has true commitments because you're applying yourself in the real world and you're organically unavailable. That's one thing. But if you're 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 trying to do it after the fact post hoc almost you're, you're trying to like script this dynamic that's going to lead to a lot of trouble yeah and so I, I have another question then sure they're, they're fascinating so obviously you mentioned 434 and you went through the stages of um uh dealing with um what's, what's the <clears throat> thing? Right. Right. Of the verse. basically you know What's the what? How, how should we try? Let me get the translation out so we just. Uh, I I don't want to not translate it properly. Four three four. Just bear with me. So yeah. So when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Yeah, ill conduct," that's one way of seeing it as well, right? Right. Right. So the first stages is that you advise them, and if they persist, you don't share beds. Um. And but if they still per per persist, then you. Well, the translation here, which is, I think, Mustafa Khattab, is you discipline them. Um, and I know that sounds really, really uh, crazy for the liberal secular folk. Right. But the reason I mentioned it is there is an orthodox Islamic ethical uh, way of dealing with each of the stages. Now, the reason I mentioned this is because we can't cover that here now, because that's right, another right. series. A whole, different, whole different, yeah. It's a whole, whole, whole different ball game. Yeah, so that's why yeah. I was supposed to park that for one moment. Um, but the, what I want to talk about right now is um, another scenario, okay. and the scenario is um, you go to the gym, you're keeping yourself quite fit, and you know you have your needs as a male. Your wife, mashallah, she's doing great work. She's probably got like, I don't know, four or five kids, whatever. She is very busy at home. She's doing everything that she needs to do. It's a loving relationship. But she has really let herself go, right? Right. And it's starting to, to affect, for example, your intimacy. And, you know, I remember I was speaking to one brother about this years ago. I think he was managing a... Uh, a marriage service and he was dealing with like marital issues and we used to speak about things like this and he realized that men just do not have the ability to express you know to say to their loved ones and vice versa sometimes maybe sisters have the same problem too i guess but right, obviously right. we're talking about from a green pill perspective um you know the men are not able to say listen you've just let yourself go you know, you're not the same. You could easily change certain things in order for you to be far more attractive. Right. You know, right. how do you do that? What would you teach 
as someone who's trying to graduate from the school of green pill to do to actually be direct and authentic with their loved ones to uplift them for them to have some transformations to improve at least the physical side of the relationship beautiful question beautiful. Oh, by the way on that side point that i remember yeah. making a joke with that brother and i was like <laughs> some sisters are like Oh, you're so shallow. Why are you judging me? It's the inside that counts. And I said, well, yeah, well, that is the problem. <laughs> the inside was the problem because you've been eating too much. You're gluttonous. <laughs> you're nafsi. You don't care about these things anymore. You don't care about our physical, you know, intimacy anymore. <clears throat> That's right, right. Right. This is a manifestation of what is the inside. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. But yeah, so this, so, this is a real brother's problem. Huh? Like yeah, so we were just having <laughs> but, you know, It's but, really you know, interesting. It's, it's true, it's true. If, if yeah. you know, if someone has really let themselves go for certain reasons, it's because they haven't prioritized certain things, right? Absolutely, and, yeah. And um, <clears throat> the dedication to certain things or the vision for their relationship has is not is not aligned with the, with right. this us, um, and they need to be brought back into line. Say, look, you know, you need to sort some stuff out. So, what uh, what would you teach a future green green pillar uh, or a gra future graduate on how to deal with that scenario? Beautiful question. I actually I've dealt with this with clients and you know I want to put out a disclaimer for people who don't know me I am married all my brothers are married we have wonderful yeah. marriages we're very secure in our marriages we are we are undeniably the heads of our households right all all our them. marriages alhamdulillah and I'm not saying that to flex or out of ego I'm saying that because I I understand that people want to know whether you're congruent and that's a very that's a very valid Thing to, to want to know are you credible are you practicing what you preach this is not something to flex about it's a it's it's supposed to be normal like masculinity manhood at a very basic working level should be a normal thing it was for centuries mm -hmm. right so when i say are you a real man i'm not talking about are you reaching the pinnacles of manhood where you're you're the caliph now you can you can govern an entire society your authority can be exercised over even the best of men i'm just saying can you exercise authority well over a family unit that's something mm -hmm. every man should be able to access unless they have some very extreme issues right and so i am married and everything we're talking about i'm very free with my wife about and she's very supportive of, of everything i was crying in front of her uh yesterday w w when we were going through some of the hadith and that's she was so. like you know she she was comforting me because they were so beautiful to me to see uh the 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 prophetic tradition from Allah and so you, you can you can be very close and open with your women folk from a place of authority from a place mm -hmm. where, where you're give, you're routinely giving them tarbiya disciplining and nurturing educating and supporting redirecting right and you have to be the more patient party in the long run if you want to be the leader and so a man in, in the situation you're you're referring to he needs to understand that she didn't just let herself go alone. He also let her, her go. He, he also let her let herself go. Let's put it that way. He allowed her to let herself go and didn't act as the impetus, the stimulus to keep her on track through love and tough love, right? Through approval and disapproval in the right ways, right? With the right values underpinning what he wants, which is obviously prophetic advice and prophetic values. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't be gluttonous. Your body is a trust. Your your intentions for your husband are a form of ibadah. You maintaining yourself for your spouse, whether it's for your husband or wife, is a form of worship with the right intention and so on and so forth. So that that person, that man in this case, has to own up to that. That you have a you have a responsibility to play for whether your wife was protected and guided. And if you can own up to that, now you can intervene, right? You have to be honest though, and you have to account yourself. And you should tell her that too, that I shouldn't have allowed this, right? This is how a man will talk. And a wannabe alpha who hasn't actually reached manhood will posture as if he wants authority, but he won't actually enact it responsibly and say, he'll only say, it's your fault, right? 
a man who's responsible wouldn't wouldn't in most cases have allowed the problem to go unaddressed for too long, unless again there's some extreme circumstances. Like he's 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 the caliph. He's got so much on his hands. He's taking care of so many people. But we're talking to the average guy. So the average guy has to swallow that pill. That's the first green pill. The second one is you need to sit your wife down and have an intervention from a place of concern. And you need to come with a plan. How is she going to actually get started on this journey that's going to feel uncomfortable? She's going to have a lot of resistance at first. She's going to feel anxious. She's going to feel insecure. And those are very natural things for her to feel. She might even have been spoiled, and you've, again, facilitated that in this case. So you have to be ready to deal with these uh, any possible objections, understand where they, where they actually stem from, insecurity, uh, spoiled nuffs. It could be both, right? Both dynamics at play. And you need to know when to reassure her and when to not accept excuses. This is the application yes. of majesty and beauty. Listen, I love you. I've made a big mistake. I haven't attended to your health. We need to do some couples workouts, okay? And I promise you, things are going to get good if you put your effort into this. And I'm going to take care of you and guide you through this. And we're going to start with baby steps. But what I need from you is an understanding that this is important for you and for me. And beyond all, Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you understand what I said? Do you have questions? Right? Be a, be a teacher. Yeah, it's like being a mentor, you know, and, and and but that starts with very frank, authentic conversations, yeah. and and telling them, look, this this, I you know, and it starts with you know that place of love and commitment that you have right. a vision for your marriage, right. you have a vision for your relationship, you want your relationship to be as optimal as possible for the sake of Allah, you want your house to be you know a house of taqwa, God consciousness, absolutely, yeah. You, when you both realize that you know you have rights over each other, like you know, if you know, my wife said to me, I want you to have bigger shoulders, and I'm gonna start, you know, smashing the gym and doing extra sets on shoulders, for example, right? <laughs> right, right. That's it, right? You know, yeah. you know, it's she wants, I want her to feel pleased, right? So, right. if that you know, she said that to me, I'd be like, let's go, let's do more shoulder work, right? right? Let's do more shoulder work, right. right. And likewise, you know, when you speak to your wife, you say, you know, this is this is something that maybe you used to have and you can still have it. Right. Because obviously you don't want to you don't want to tell them to have things that that now is, you know, gone. Right. Because people change and life is full of transformations. But if something that is possible for them to work on, then you tell them. It, with a place of love and if needed assertiveness. But you provide that solution, as you said, you provide you know? Here's a great workout. Here's a really good website. I bought you a set of weights or I facilitated uh, stuff at home for you to do. Absolutely. Or, yeah. you know, whatever the case may be. And you and 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 every and when they start improving, positive affirmation, you you, you know, you 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 praise them. And Absolutely. Just, and just like we do with any human, even with brothers, if you're uh, you know a leader of an organization, that's what you do with brothers too. Um, and also with if she fails and she like maybe oh I've had a bad week. Then you don't crush them, yeah. You don't have this tyrannical authority saying, "Oh, I knew it. You're never good enough. You don't love me. You're lazy." That language shouldn't be expressed. But you're like, "Don't worry. Let's get back on track," and you empower them to get back on track as long as Absolutely. they have the same vision and goals. So, um, make make it, make it attainable, like you said. Make it attainable. Yeah. I it built a gym uh, for yeah. my. Sorry, I was just saying I built a gym for my wife and my sister-in-law. I built, you know, I, I built it from scratch. It's a fully functional gym. It preserves their their modesty. You know, no man can see them. They have access to it every single Brilliant. day. Brilliant. And I maintain it. Right. It's so simple. And then, of course, like as you mentioned, reaffirm what you find beautiful about them, what you desire for them, and from them. You know, from from a place of passion. Be romantic. And, and you can also be subtle. You don't have to always be direct. Just take them by the hand and just do an impromptu workout. Five minutes. Let's get you warmed up. Yeah. I also think, I think subtlety is culturally based as well. Yeah. Like there are some communities you just have to say it straight. That's how they work. You no, just that's have true. To say, this that's is true. it. Khalas. 
if sometimes when you're too subtle, they think you're talking about someone else. <laughs> that's also very <laughs> true. That's also very especially, true. So especially sometimes in the Daisy community, like you're talking about them, but they're like, oh yeah, I know that person. There's some auntie who does that. And like, no, 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 no. It's you. Yeah, it's you. Sometimes yeah. you have to be direct. Yeah. Right, right. That's why I think in certain cultures, there's such a thing as body shaming. Like, right. you know, some cultures, I think even in my culture, right, where my mom is from, you sometimes you body shame and body shame as a positive thing, you get them to like start fixing up, right? That's how it works. It's a cultural thing, you know. If you were to say to them, Oh, don't worry, just have another cake, you only live once and just You're spoiling you know, enough. Yeah, it's 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 dangerous. But right. you know, in certain cultures, uh uh shaming to a certain degree, especially amongst the women themselves. Uh, it could have a transformative impact, right? Yeah, it can, it can be seen as a corrective mechanism. Of yeah, a absolutely. Corrective mechanism, you know, it's true. So, uh, yeah, uh, there was m more we wanted to talk about, which I think you come back on again to talk about, because I wanted to talk about things like, right, you know, other ways feminism is being covertly misogynistic. Yes, uh, modern speakers. Uh, you know, I have this issue about modern speakers. Many speakers, they don't even talk about feminism. They haven't mentioned it once, I think, yeah? Um, and could be the case because they have a lot of female followers. Allah knows. Um, but the thing is, you know, those things are quite dangerous because we follow the algorithm. And that's quite dangerous because our role as du'at and speakers and teachers is to give people what they need, not what they want, right? Um, so Absolutely. I want to talk about men's major issues today, some examples of ma uh, emasculation, uh, how do you help boys and men succeed despite the, dis the systemic emasculation, what right. kind of development programs are there? I mean, Yanni, but we've been going for three hours and 13 minutes. So um, it just goes to show how neglected this subject has been. You know? Yes, so we need to do a we need to do a part two. We need to do a part two. We gotta do a part two, inshallah. So we have to do a part two because I do believe a lot of people are gonna raise far more, a lot of questions with some of the stuff that you've mentioned. Right. Because you're new to them as well. They're like, wow, really? What's this? What about this? Sure. So uh what I would suggest as well, we should do another video and we should do a live like sure. a QA on this video, because there are yeah. gonna be a lot of questions on this video, and that would be interesting. People sure. could sure. It would be really good for your stuff because people will, will, come, will bring people on board. They'll ask you, a it'll be like live mentoring. Oh, I heard you said about this. Well, how, how would Green Pill do with this? How would prophetic masculinity do with this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Really, absolutely. really good. Yeah, I mean, That'd be I great. asked the first question and, and I gave you another sub question. And the way you right, just right. Uh, brought it back, I felt that you were telling me off. It was really good. And <laughs> in a nice way, I was like, okay, I've been put in my place. <laughs> so, part of the I felt part of the, draw of the scenario. It was brilliant. But yeah, bro, so look, I mean, um, brothers and sisters, please keep in touch with brother Fahim Farouk, the Green Pill Coach. You can find him on Instagram, on Telegram, on uh, Facebook. What do they have to type in again? Just If they just look up the Green Pill, three separate words, they'll find the page. Or the the, uh, the community, that's right. on uh, Facebook, yeah. That's on Facebook, right? And on Instagram, it's Majesty, and Beauty. Majesty and Beauty, all Brilliant. all together. And then they'll be they would have access to your Telegram accounts through there, right? Right, right. And I'll, I'll uh, give them access. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. So we'll do a part two, maybe <clears> as a video or a live. I'm 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 my I'm leaning towards a live. That'll be brilliant. Sure. Because there'll be like loads of guys and even sisters coming on board saying, my husband this, my wife this, how do I deal with this? And, <laughs> and to be honest, to be honest, right, it would show green pill in action, right? Because yeah, that, yeah. that, that hardly happens. You have a lot of these red pill brothers, if you like, um, you know, talking to women or they're having these interactions and they seem intellectually and socially dominant. They've They've won. They've they've won the argument, right? Um, and it, and it promotes that type of narrative. But we want to pro promote the green pill, prophetic masculinity, um, so and I think a live would be great. But yeah, so yeah, that'd be great. That'd be absolutely wonderful. Inshallah. Well, bless you, bro. Uh, I'm gonna Amen. stop the recording, but stay here. So, brothers, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.